Hi, everybody. We're just going to open it up um, 15 minutes early. So if you have any issues with audio, you can work that out. We have found that it really works best if you join on your computer and then call in using the number and the audio panel um, and making sure to enter your participant ID. I see it. Okay. So where it needs to be? Yeah. Okay. Okay. How's how's the speed of the slides? Is that good? Yeah. Perfect. All right. Looks Thank good. you, Emily. No problem. I'm going to switch it back over to Ken. Okay. Let me bring that back up here real quick. Okay, there we go. Should see the agenda now. Yep. Yeah, I see okay. it. And Greg, I saw that you just joined and I'm unmuting you. Um, feel free to mute yourself on your end, but just want to make sure that all the staff are ready to go when they want to chat. See, oh, it, you unmuted me, but then it said I can unmute myself. So you just gave me the permission to do that. Exactly. Okay, what is the meet the meeting ID? Um, it should be that. Do, are, do you actually want me to read it to you, or do you want me to just tell you where it is? Um. Well, <clears throat> I looked on the email and it wasn't there, and it's not on so the agenda package. Should. You should be using the link that is sent to you after you register for the meeting. Yeah, I have to use a different device. So I have to enter it in somewhere that I don't have the email. Okay, so that just means you'll have two names show up, I think. So the webinar ID is, I can, I'll send it to you on Teams. Okay, thanks. Just making sure my audio is working. I can hear you. Cool. And Greg, I don't think you're muted on your end, but it's up to you. All right, it looks mm -hmm. like we have 22 attendees already. So if anybody has any issues, technical issues, you can feel free to write into the 
um, question pod, and we'll try to get those resolved before 1.30 when, when we call, when Kent calls the meeting to order. Hey, Emily. Yes. Yeah. Uh, this is Jacob. So I'm noticing on the GoToWebinar menu on the right um, where the phone symbol is and it says people can hear you, click to mute yourself. Is that for if I was going in through the computer? Like, should I mute that? Um, no, you don't have to do that because you, so you should have on your audio dashboard on the control panel, you should have phone calls selected. Is that, is that what you see? That is correct, yes. Okay, so then you'll just mute yourself like using your regular phone mute. Okay, which is what I've been doing, so, okay. Yeah. Thank you. And Emily, when you mentioned that, whatever you called it, the question thing, are you just talking about the chat? So it will look different, so staff sees a different thing because they're kind of panelists. But yeah, it's a little pod called the question pod, and it, it'll be on that control panel, the GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, so wow. your, yours might be a little bit different than what um, attendees yeah, are seeing. I don't see that. So Steve, what you should see is the a, like a chat box. Yeah, I have a I have a chat button. Yeah, so you can you can um, talk to organizers and panelists via chat. Okay. All right. Good. And then anyone that's in attendee any mode, and you should be. Um, muted right now, you will see a question um, pod pop up in your control panel. But I do see that, Mac, you have your hand raised. Would you like, I can unmute you, or if you have something that you just want to type into the question pod, feel free to do that. So why don't you type into the question pod if you would like me to unmute you. And for folks that, that have just joined as attendees, um, you'll all join in mute and then we'll kind of get started at 1.30 and Kent will go through kind of how we're going to handle this meeting. Um, but thanks for joining early. If you have any issues with audio or you can't see screens, um, please type into the question pod. You should be able to see the tax meeting agenda on your screen.
Thanks again, everybody, for joining early. If you're having any audio or technical issues, feel free to write into the question pod, and we'll get those started um, and dealt with before we get the meeting going. Um, so thanks again. And just before we get started here, I just want to let you guys all know if you can't see a screen or you can't hear anything, please type into the question pod and we'll get that sorted. Um, for those of you that are curious about how this is going to work, Kent, I'm sure will give you a better description than I'm about to. Um, but essentially, hopefully you can find the control panel on the GoToWebinar and you'll see a little hand um, icon with an arrow. Uh, he'll be kind of monitoring, uh, him and Melinda will be monitoring that to kind of guide conversations and we'll mute, unmute folks um, as the conversation goes. It's kind of just easier to start everybody off so we don't get um, any feedback. There will definitely be opportunities um, for conversation. So just hang tight until we get going. Good afternoon, everybody. This is Kent Mormon, the chair of the Transportation Advisory Committee. I'd like to welcome you all to our first uh, remote meeting. Um, as Emily was explaining earlier, if you have questions, please enter them in the chat room. You are muted until uh, we get to the question and answer uh, time. And uh, there's also a place to uh, raise your hand if need be. So um, um, it's over on the, uh, on the uh, control panel. And if you'll do that, then Emily will let me know um, that you'd like to speak. Um, I'd like to go ahead and call the meeting to order. And with that, Melinda, if you could take or tell us what members you have online and, and also the alternates, we'll do roll a little differently this time. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Chair. All right. And now I will start. All right. So I see Aaron Busto, uh, all of Dr. Cobb, Alex Heidwright, Amanda Brimmer, Andrea LaRue, Andrew Spurgeon, Bill Soroy, Brad Talbert, Brody Ayers, <laughs> excuse me, Brian Weimer, Carol Buchanan, Carson Priest, Charlie Stanfield, Chessie Brady, uh, Chris Chavon, 
Chris Hudson, Danny Herman, David Kurt Kretzinger, Deborah Baskett, Eileen Yazzie, Eric Sabina, Eugene Howard, Joffrey Chiapella, Greg McKinnon, Jim Euston, Jean Sanson, Jennifer Carpenter, Joanne Matson, John Cotton, Jordan Rudell, Karen Schneider, Karen Wodomsky, Kenneth Johnstone, Kevin Ash, Lauren Pulver, Lawrence Long, Lisa Hood, Lisa Nguyen, Max Callison, Matthew Helfant, Megan Davis, Melanie Choquette, Mike Whitaker, Moira Moon, Paul DeSatis, <laughs> Phil Greenwald, Richard Pilgrim, Richard Zamora, Sangu Lee, Sarah Grant, Cheryl Mikado, Stephen Strominger, Steve Durian, Kim Hester, Kim Kirby, Todd Cottrell, Tom Wright, Travis Noon, and Zachary Feldman. Um, if you did not hear me call your name, obviously since everyone's on mute, if you could please email me at mstevens at drcog.org and we'll make sure that you're added to the minutes. And with that, Mr. Chair, we do have a quorum. Thank you. Um, I also appreciate those of you that uh, did send any questions in ahead of time to uh, Melinda. And as we get to the, that area, um, we will um, uh, read those uh, questions and, and have the staff that's presenting uh, answer that question. At this time, I'd like to open it up to public comment and uh, we'll let it go, go there. Um, I'm not seeing any hands raised at this time, Mr. Chair. All right, thank you. We'll continue now with the um, uh, meeting. Uh, the summary of uh, is was sent out on the last meeting. I would ask that you vote um, accordingly um, and uh, to the tech members that that was sent out to. So at this time, if you would enter your vote, First of all, I guess I would ask, is there any discussion or changes? I'm not seeing any hands. Okay, we'll go ahead and entertain a motion to approve the minutes. Did someone raise their hand? so that they could do that. I have not seen any hands raised. Okay, if I could get someone to- Oh, I got one. Okay. Uh, for John Cotton. Okay, so go ahead, Tom, and uh, unmute him and we'll let him make that motion. Okay, Emily, I'm having, I'm clicking and it's not letting me unmute him. Is, could you assist? Yep. Tom, we're unmuting you. You should be unmuted. Uh, this is John Cotton. I make a motion to approve the uh, minutes from the last meeting. Okay, it's been moved. And is there uh, a second? Looks like we have one from Phil Greenwald. Okay, Phil. Uh, if you can unmute him and we'll hear it. Second. Okay, thank you, Phil. So it's been moved and seconded, and so now if you uh, cast your votes on the on the uh, item, that would be great. And I brought up the wrong one screen there. There we go. And it looks like so far we have 10 folks that have voted on the tax minutes all for yay. Okay. Give you um, another minute here to vote and then we'll, uh, we'll close the voting. Kent, could you just give a quick 
um, how people should follow the directions to vote or how they might find that link. I'm getting a couple questions. Okay, that was sent out in an email to the to the members um, to for voting, and it was from Melinda, I believe, and it w probably came out last Friday. And there's a link there that you uh, click on, and then it will um, uh, take you. You'll put your name in. It'll ask if you're a primary or an alternate, and then it will um, take you to the question. And it looks like we have 12 people that have voted all yay. Okay. We'll go ahead and uh, count that vote as done. And uh, if additional um, get to that later, we can we can add that at, at another time. But I believe that's uh, all in favor so far. So we'll move on. Uh, our next one is an action item. And it is a discussion of the draft eligibility rules and selection process for the R T O T and T or R O R T O T and T um, side set and then Steve, uh, I believe you're the one that's uh, going to present that. So let you have it. Uh, yes, and I, I assume you can see it up there. Oh wait, not yet. There we go. Yeah, now it is. Okay. All right. Thank you, Kent. Uh, this is Steve Cook, uh, manager of uh, travel modeling and travel transportation operations with Dr. Cog. Uh, this is uh, attachment B of your agenda, and this is an action item. Uh, so this is talking about the uh, tips set aside for the regional transportation operations and technology set aside program. And this action today is to recommend uh, the eligibility rules and selection process that will be carried forward uh, over the next coming uh, months. So as mentioned, uh, this set aside is part of the transportation improvement program. The uh, board when approving it and discussing it uh, allocated uh, $5 million per year uh, over the four years of the TIP. Some projects have already been programmed previously. And so that's why what ends up remaining for this call of projects is $13 million. So some of those previously programmed projects uh, went to like uh, Denver and CDOT. Uh, and it, we funded uh, closed circuit TV cameras, dynamic message signs, uh, communications infrastructure, uh, and advanced uh, signal technologies, bicycle detection. So those are the types of things um, that have already been uh, funded in the past. And so we are planning on having a, a call for projects uh, coming up in a couple months. So one key thing we wanted to uh, point out at the beginning was how, how all, of the, all of these things really relate to each other. You know, this is multimodal, you know, it's transit, it's streets, freeways, and even the aspects related to these, such as uh, maintenance and construction. And this is more about the functions and functionality of different technologies than it is to a specific mode of travel itself. And a key thing here is to uh, improve our transportation system performance and its reliability on a day-to-day -day basis, um, but also in a real-time basis, improving situational awareness for all the operators of the various types of transportation systems uh, that are out there. Uh, one thing that's uh, unique for this year, you know, this has been going on, we've had a, some variation of this set-aside program. Uh, we've had some variation of it for almost 30 years. Um, what's new for this year as an offshoot of the mobility choice blueprint last year, is now we have the involvement of the advanced mobility partnership, uh, which is really uh, two elements. Well, we'll go to that in a second. Um, but the uh, the AMP, AMP, has helped out 
with the uh, foundational system and infrastructure priority setting, uh, the types of uh, project types that should be uh, prioritized, and has really em emphasized that things need to be the devices and technology needs to be compatible and interoperable, and there needs to be collaboration uh, between the various partners. Uh, in a diagram form, uh, very, very uh, detailed here, it really highlights the, the two components of the AMP. First, there is the executive committee uh, that's uh, made up of reps from CDOT, Dr. Cog, RTD, and the Denver Metro Chamber. And then there's the uh, AMP working group and they've been meeting uh, monthly and there's several different entities on there. And we did have a question about uh, the uh, UTAC acronym there. And what that is, is the uh, University Transportation Alliance of Colorado. So that's uh, made, that whole group is made as several members from some of the transportation centers at the universities around uh, the state. And uh, Wes Marshall, has been uh, serving as the rep for that group on the, uh, on the AMP working group. And the final there, green circle there, shows how there's been a lot of uh, consultation back and forth between the AMP working group and on the right there, what's called the RTO working group, the Regional Transportation Operations Working Group. And that's a group of you know, the boots on the ground type transportation operators of, you know, both roads and of transit. Uh, and they've been meeting, uh, like we said, for almost 30 years also uh, to uh, help get into the nuts and bolts of what these technologies uh, can do uh, for helping our transportation system. So in the discussions uh, between uh, both the RTO working group and the uh, AMP working group is the, one of the first things was uh, identifying the key priority types for the types of projects for this call for projects. So you see listed up there of uh, extending traffic signal systems to those places around the area that don't have uh, good coordinated, interconnected, and communicated uh, traffic signals. Uh, number two, they're integrating and advanced traffic signal systems. So this is uh, everything from adaptive control, transit signal priority, many different things there. Uh, number three is improving the performance measurement and uh, both real time and planning level monitoring of systems. One aspect of uh, new traffic signal systems, which also alludes in item number four there, is being able to detect when there are problems with the signal system. And so that operators can be warned of this and they don't necessarily have to wait for uh, a phone call uh, from a uh, member of the public who has a concern about a certain location. Regional data sharing and coordinated traveler information uh, is extremely important. Uh, expanding traffic camera systems and especially when they are interjurisdictional, and that's really important of sharing these feeds and these views from the camera so that your neighbors can also see what's going on. Uh, item number seven there is uh, other types of field infrastructure uh, for uh, advanced functions, types of detection, detecting bicycles, things like that. And overall, the real key theme here is improving the, the situational awareness of what's going on out there, you know, especially in the real time uh, situations. Uh, one other item that the both groups uh, participated on was, was defining some of the eligibility criteria and waiting for when these things are initially, when the projects that come in are initially scored. And I wanna point out that this is described uh, in much more detail uh, in the document um, that follows in the PDF in, in another attachment there, uh, the actual detailed uh, eligibility rules and criteria. So this shows the different categories. Uh, the top two that rose to the top were improving travel reliability and associated air quality benefits. 
uh, the 20% there is for you know, how severe is the situation in that particular geographic uh, sub area of the region or in that corridor. Uh, collaboration and partnerships, addressing the regional transportation operations and technology objectives and MetroVision objectives and imp implementation, uh, innovation and transferability to uh, other jurisdictions, and then also the, uh, a risk management uh, planning element of you know, how well did the sponsor who proposed the project uh, appear to look into some of the potential pitfalls that uh, they may have to struggle with as part of the projects. And many of you are familiar with that. And of course, one of the key ones that always comes up is a right of way, as we know. So then for the overall schedule here, um, and I wanna point out that, you know, I, I think as with everything in, in today's current uh, world and situation is, we will, we will monitor things along the way as things are progressing. And, you know, there may be some flexibility with this schedule. There's no, you know, hard set legal deadline that we have to meet, but we are trying as best we can to move ahead and keep down the path of the schedule. Uh, one of the key first items is on April 22nd, I believe, is we're still planning to have a workshop, it likely be a virtual workshop, as a pre-application pre for sponsors um, to get uh, training and information uh, in terms of how to fill out app the application. And that, and that is uh, mandatory. Uh, we're going through a overall process similar to the recent set aside, other set aside programs um, that have been uh, acted on in the last few months. Uh, first, the applicants will uh, do a complete a letter of intent uh, in, I forget the exact date, but sometime in May, that a letter of intent or LOI will go through a review and screening process. And we will also involve the uh, RTO working group uh, on that. And then sponsors will be invited to uh, complete and submit their applications. Right now, looking like a uh, deadline in uh, July, uh, those applications will be reviewed and initially scored by an internal pro project review panel. Um, that will then come to the RTO working group as well as the AMP working group in late July, uh, early August um, to get their uh, assessment and feedback on the uh, re draft recommendations. And then it will would come to the TAC later in August and then finally to our Dr. Cog board or, and the RTC in September. I uh, wanna point out that uh, there was a question that was asked um, as, as part of the question packet before this, that uh, the, right now the AMP working group, you know, as it is not an official you know, Dr. Cog MPO committee will not necessarily be you know, approving the uh, draft set of projects. But we certainly uh, want to get their feedback, and I, I could imagine if they had, you know, major concerns about something, um, we would certainly take that into consideration, you know, as the list of projects moves forward, and that information would be provided to the committees. And so, with that, um, the motion is uh, listed up there, and we ask for a motion and a second on that, and then see if there's any questions. Thank you, Steve. Uh, first of all, Melinda, were there any questions that Steve didn't answer that were emailed to you? Uh, no, everyone submitted them in a timely fashion, and I was able to get them to Steve so he could address them. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, one. I'll, I'll go to one additional one that I alluded to in a in, in a uh, you know somewhat indirect sense. There was a question about you know like specific. Uh, travel modes such as BRT, and I think what I was trying to point out earlier is that in the in this techno RTO and T set aside, it's really more concerned with the functionality of certain types of equipment, devices, programs, technologies, whatever, than it really is oriented towards. Here we're going to do something for X, or here we're going to do something for this travel mode. 
So that's why I wanted to, to point that part out. Okay, thank you, Steve. Um, Emily, uh, I think at this time we'll open it up to questions uh, from the members um, and alternates. Uh, are there any hands raised that would like to speak? Uh, Kent, this is Melinda. I am not seeing any hands currently. Give me okay. one more time, just to make sure. But no, it does not look like anyone has any questions that I can see. Okay. We do have a couple of questions from the question pod, and really quick, I can just read you the asker, and then you could call on them, um, oh. or if you prefer, I can just read them out loud. Um, if you want to, just go ahead and uh, read them out loud, and and then Steve can can answer them might be a little more efficient. Okay. There are three questions in here, so I will just, I'll go with the first one. Could the RTO and T funding be used to fund tolling equipment for arterial BRT uh, slash managed lanes? And that came in from Alex Hyde Wright. What was, what was the first couple of words you mentioned there, Emily? For tolling what? Uh, could it be used to fund tolling equipment for arterial BRT slash managed lanes? Um, I'm going to let, I'll do a quick stab and then I'll let Greg chime in. Normally for just routine tolling equipment, that's really not what this uh, set aside is geared towards. Now, if part of that equipment was uh, monitoring device TV cameras that was being shared among other entities, I that might be eligible there. And if Greg is there, I'm going to ask him potentially to chime in. But my initial guess is that typical tolling equipment you is that's only for the tolling is normally not part of this. Yeah, this is Greg. Uh, the um, uh, the intent is to improve operations. So, if this is part of the improvement of operations uh, as part of a system, then that's something that that can be considered. But if it's just you know buying the equipment to um, uh, to be deployed for for the toll collection itself, that's the, that's that's not going to be part of it. It depends on the application. That's the type of thing that we would get through the uh, letter of intent and then we could work with the sponsor. Okay, uh, next question, Emily. Next question is from Rick Pilgrim and he says, in the list of project type priorities, number three, performance management and monitoring, does this include a mechanism for helping the regional view to be implemented? Perhaps with the disagreement of a local jurisdiction how will that kind of governance be conducted through the RTO and T or something different? Emily, Emily, do you want to answer that? One? <laughs> um, from this set aside program, I really don't know how specific it'll get into all those details at this time of the, uh, the, the, the data performance. Let me go back to that one. Uh, here we go. Performance measurement and monitoring. Um, for the types of things that are corridor specific to local governments that are doing it already, yes, those those we have in place and we've been funding those. Um, I'm, I'm not sure I totally understand the question, Ron, Greg, or Emily. Um, I mean. I I, I presume right. it's something to do with, uh, you know, uh, that if we come up with a, a, a performance monitoring system that isn't in, uh, uh, consistent with what a local jurisdiction does. Uh, and, and again, I guess we have to point to that's why we have the two phase system to bring in how do we coordinate and uh, rationalize these applications am amongst each other. Uh, the goal is to fund regional transportation operations. And uh, you know, if we if there are jurisdictions that are uh, adopting other uh, avenues uh, and uh, imp, uh, applications that, that aren't aligned with the region, it's going to be harder to fund those. Okay. 
All right. Um, do you want to, uh, Emily or Melinda, if you done unmute Rick and see if that answered his question? I would be happy to unmute him. Thank you. Rick, go ahead once you're unmuted. Well, <laughs> yeah, it's hard for me to keep my big mouth shut, but, um, <laughs> Uh, you know, you pretty well answered the question. I think that, you know, we, we've, we've had uh, a long, many decades of, of terrific uh, jurisdiction by jurisdiction management of their signal systems. But I can, I could see, I mean, the previous question was about BRT and managed lanes. Um, if we decide at the region level that something should Across these uh, jurisdictional boundaries, w w we might get into some differences of opinion, and I just I think we need to be aware of uh, the need for some sort of governance mechanism that'll help us iron those differences out. Um, it's probably not something specific here. The only place I could find to glue it was in number three, where if we're trying to do something that's a regional benefit others might have local jurisdictions might have to give a little bit and just hopeful that that can happen so thanks okay okay thank you um what was your next question emily so we have a couple more questions um the okay. next one is from phil, phil greenwald and he says would it be possible to send the tac examples of previously funded projects Ah uh, yes, um, that's where we, we can send that again. But if you go to your uh, agenda packet for this one, we reference uh, two other TAC presentations from last year, and in either one, either one of them or in both of them, we list the most recently funded set of projects. I think there were 20 or so there. And we can send it out also in a separate email so you don't have to dig for it. Um, we can send that out uh, after the PAC meeting. Steve, um, you might also send out where the technology side comes in because those were just RTO only. Well, well, they were technology because they were also, last time we, we merged two previous programs, the RTO and the ITS, which is uh, intelligent transportation system uh, technology pools. So it did have the technology aspects in that. Oh, okay, thank you for the correction. Um, if we'll you get that out. Okay, thank you. Um, if Phil, if you have any more questions on that, um, raise your hand and we'll uh, unmute you. Yeah, and, and, and Phil also, con contact us if you want more information, because we have lists of projects going back 20 years. Thank you. And then we do have one more question um, from Brian Weimer, and I think this is a, a little bit longer, so I'm, if it's okay with him, I'm just gonna unmute him. So Brian, I'm about to unmute you. Okay, go ahead, Brian, when you're unmuted. Okay, so hopefully you can hear me. Question is, is that we're trying to integrate uh, fiber uh, for signal systems as well as um, government data. And so it might be a combination of the two. So it's unclear to me if that makes fiber optic eligible or ineligible under this type of submittal. Thoughts, clarification? Um, I mean, obviously, ultimately, it'll be our federal partners, but I will let I will let Greg uh, maybe respond initially to that. Uh, yeah, this is related to the source of funding. It is CMAC, uh, and that means it has to be a transportation project. So when posed with this question, my answer has always been it has to be primarily for transportation. Uh, uh, and then if the the infrastructure is planned to be used elsewhere, 
um, uh, down the road and not part of the project, uh, that's um, that's something that, that that we might be able to entertain. But I agree with Steve. We we would defer to the the, the federal input because we are trying to uh, comply with the uh, the CMAC regs. Well, that's something that we should put in our letter of intent in terms of percentage or number of that if there's a combination uh, utilization of that fiber that that should be discussed i agree and and in answers to some of the questions that i've had previously about this it, an example might help it's like okay well you know the last traffic light uh was here and then we extended to the next traffic light but in between was our government building so the the project shouldn't be connecting to the government building just for the sake of connecting to the government building, but there is uh, there is a good idea to put the facility to to accommodate that connection down the road. So you'd have a pull box ready for the stub out to that building. But it, unless that connection has a transportation purpose to the building, then it's something that would be difficult to consider. Greg, this is Kent. Um, just following up on Brian's question. Um, would it be good uh, if it's smart city related to note that? Uh, I That is a good question and maybe something uh, for Emily to consider. Uh, you know, we're, we're working uh, with the CMAC funding, which had the requirement of it has to be a transportation project. So, you know, we'd have to make sure that we're describing as a transportation project. Uh, how we're going to entertain the whole smart city, smart region stuff is stuff that I'm not as familiar with. Okay, thank you. Brian, did that answer all your questions? Somewhere? Yes, thank you. Thank you. Um, are there any more hands raised or, uh, or uh, chat box items on this? It looks like we have answered all of the questions that were submitted and there are no hands raised. Okay. With that, um, there's a motion before you on the board um, here, and um, what I would ask is if, if uh, someone would like to move it or amend it, and just raise your hand and we'll get you unmuted so you can do that. Okay, it looks like we have a motion from Art Griffith, so let me go ahead and unmute him. Okay. Yeah, I would like to make Yes, I'd like to make, I'm sorry. Um, yes, I'd like to make a motion to approve this item um, as, to the as Regional Transportation Street. Committee. Okay. Uh, there's been a motion to approve what's on your screen. Is there a second? Yep, it looks like we have a second from Steve Durian. I will unmute him okay. as well. Steve? I second the motion. Thank you, Steve. So it's been moved and seconded. And if you will uh, vote ag again, and uh, again, it was on the email that was sent to you, and it should be the second question. And it looks like we've received 19 votes and they're all yay votes. Okay. Give it another 30 seconds here and then we'll uh, close the voting. And I think we're pretty close to 30 seconds. So uh, what was the final vote there again? It's 20 people have voted all yay in favor of vote. Okay, no, none against and then no, no abstentions, all right? Correct. All right, thank you. Next, we'll move on to the discussion of urban arterials, uh, multimodal safety improvement set aside. And Ron is going to present that. And um, again, this is an action item. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, Ron Papsdorf, Director of Transportation Planning and Operations here at Dr. Cog. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for participating in our first remote Transportation Advisory Committee meeting. I appreciate everyone's patience as we work through this process. Um, so uh, this item is attachment number C in attachment C in the agenda packet relating to the Urban Arterial Multimodal Safety Improvements Program, eligibility rules and selection process. Um, so just by way of uh, reminder, um, we, uh, the, we have identified this as a joint effort between CDOT and Dr. Cog to support infrastructure projects that improve safety, especially for vulnerable users along urban arterials within the Dr. Cog MPO area and consistent with CDOT's and Dr. Cog's Vision Zero efforts. You'll recall that um, CDOT had previously, CDOT Region 1 had previously allocated $25 million of state flexible Senate Bill 267 funds for urban arterial safety improvements and $26 million of state transit, also Senate Bill 267 funds for the Denver area arterial street pre-BRT and BRT uh, transit elements. Uh, that $51 million uh, is being proposed to be combined with a new $26 million pot of funds that TAC recommended uh, to the RTC and the board to utilize um, to um, invest in safety improvements on urban arterials within the entire Dr. Cog MPO area, utilizing uh, $9 million of unanticipated Dr. Cog directed surface transportation block grant funds and $17 million of CDOT directed um, SDBG funds. The program goals are to reduce fatal and serious injury crashes, support a transportation system that safely accommodates all modes of travel, improve transit access and multimodal mobility, support the development of connected urban and employment centers and multimodal corridors throughout the region, and provide safe access uh, to economic opportunity and mobility for residents of all ages, incomes, and abilities, including, as I said, those vulnerable users. Um, there are three uh, funding categories available for this program. As I mentioned, the uh, Senate Bill 267 funds plus the Surface Transportation Block Grant funds um, available. The first two, the Senate Bill 267 funds are available only for projects located within CDOT Region 1. Part of Dr. Cog, the SDBG funds, that $26 million would be available for projects located within the Dr. Cog MPO boundary. Um, the Senate Bill 267 funds are limited to projects located on arterial state highways that otherwise meet the program criteria. The surface transportation block grant funds, those federal funds, are available for projects on the federal aid eligible roadways, especially those that are on the high injury network. Uh, that also otherwise meet the program criteria. And by way of reminder, uh, basically federal aid eligible roadways are anything classified as a collector or above uh, within the MPO boundary. We will, as part of the application program, have a lot of resources available uh, to potential applicants, including maps of the high entry network, those critical corridors, um, as well as the federal aid eligible system and lots of other resources. So the, that information will all be available at the time of application. Um, we're bringing this uh, process forward to try to meet the spending requirements of Senate Bill 267 funds. Um, the Transportation Advisory Committee, as I mentioned, has previously recommended to RTC and board uh, the uh, matching of the $9 million of Dr. Cog directed surface transportation block grant funds uh, due to the scheduling impacts of everyone's response to COVID-19. The RTC and the board meetings last week were canceled. So that, that recommendation will go forward to the Regional Transportation Committee and the board at their April meeting. And uh, if we get a positive recommendation from the TAC today on the eligibility criteria, we will also take the eligibility criteria forward for an action item with both of those committees. So um, for the funding requirements, um, all eligible and funded projects must be able to complete all activities and submit all billings no later than June 1st of 2024. That's to meet that uh, funding 
schedule requirement of the Senate Bill 267 funds. Um, applicants may specify a preference for those state-only funds uh, for projects on state highways within Region 1 of CDOT. Um, but CDOT and Dr. Cog can't guarantee that a specific funding source for a particular project at this time will consider those requests um, against the available funding. Um, we have established in partnership with CDOT a minimum grant request of $250,000 and a maximum grant request of $15 million uh, and a minimum local match requirement of 20%. Um, we did have a question from Eileen Yazzie. Um, about the match requirement. It is a 20% minimum local match for all funds. That was um, what we have uh, negotiated and uh, CDOT and Dr. Cog are recommending as part of this eligibility. Uh, Eileen also had an additional question that if a candidate project already has federal or TIP funding associated with it, um, are those funds counted as local match? No, they are not. Um, federal funds obviously can't match um, other federal funds, so that would not count. We're uh, we are looking for a 20% minimum uh, local match, uh, non-federal, non-state to leverage these funds. Um, by way of evaluation criteria, uh, uh, in cooperation with CDOT, we've identified safety, uh, transit and enhanced mobility for vulnerable users, um, some other considerations including innovation, technology, the potential for devolution of state highways for um, state highway funded projects um, and benefit cost of the of the proposed uh, project. Uh, we're also looking for a demonstration of public support and local match. Uh, one of the questions uh, relate a couple of questions we got uh, in advance of the meeting today related to um, whether um, mat local match above the 20% minimum. Uh, would um, garner uh, more consideration or a higher score? And the answer is yes. Um, and then again, finally, readiness, the extent to which the applicant uh, demonstrates the ability to meet those project delivery requirements uh, weighted at 20%. All this information is in the uh, draft eligibility and selection process document uh, in your agenda packet. So the application and selection process that's anticipated, uh, we expect to release the call for projects on or about Monday, April 20th. Uh, that would follow the approval of the eligibility and selection process um, by all of the committees, um, as well as the approval of the funding uh, program uh, by the Dr. Cog Board and the Transportation Commission. Um, applications would be due to CDOT uh, no later than Wednesday, June 3rd by 5 p.m. Um, there will be a scoring and selection panel that will uh, include representatives from uh, CDOT Region 1 Traffic, CDOT Division of Transit and Rail, CDOT uh, Region 1 Deputy Director, a member of Dr. Cog staff, and a representative of RTD staff. That committee, that um, scoring uh, panel will score the project applications against the criteria and the evaluation criteria. We would then convene an advisory committee uh, to review the technical scoring for the projects and formulate a recommendation to that scoring and selection panel. That advisory committee would be made up of two CDOT staff plus one staff representative from each of the eight Dr. Cog uh, subregions. The scoring and selection panel would reconvene to review the advisory committee recommendations um, and finally make uh, develop a final recommendation uh, for funding allocations to the, uh, to the uh, projects that applied for funds. Uh, those, that funding recommendation would go through uh, the, tech, the technical advisory committee, the regional transportation committee, the Dr. Cog Board of Directors, and the CDOT, uh, the Colorado Transportation Commission for final action we anticipate by the mid-July. Mid um, before I get to the specific recommendation in front of you this afternoon, I did want to go through some of the other written questions, and we do appreciate getting these in advance to help uh, facilitate the conversation. Uh, so Eileen Yazzie from Denver um, asked, confirming 
that an agency can apply for more than one project. That is correct. Uh, in our conversations between Dr. Cog and CDOT, we, deter we uh, determined not to put a limit um, on number of applications uh, from jurisdictions. Um, Eileen had another question that can the funding be used to support just a design work phase um, or uh, what about funding design and construction for one project? Um, the intent with this program is to fund project improvements. So uh, would not entertain uh, simply a, a design uh, of a project. Uh, we, we, we intend to fund construction projects. Um, a, an application could include design and other phases, but it would need to, would need to ultimately um, include a construction phase. Um, Eileen's other question, I talked about the uh, match. Phil Greenwald had a question, what is the detailed process for allocating the surface transportation block grant funds? Is it a, is it a sub-regional or a regional process used to allocate these dollars? Um, Phil, I would say that this is a bit of a hybrid process as it's it's most similar to one of our regional set-asides. So it is sort of a regional um, app, uh, allocation process and selection process. Um, obviously, because the funds include both state funds that are normally allocated directly by CDOT, as well as some Dr. Cog-directed SDBG funds, this is a bit of a hybrid process, a cooperative process between Dr. Cog, our sub-regional forums, and CDOT. Uh, and RTD to ultimately select uh, projects and allocate funds. Um, Phil also asked about the High Injury Network and federal aid eligible maps. As I mentioned earlier, those will be available uh, when the application is released along with a number of other resource uh, resources to assist applicants in uh, putting together their applications. Um, Phil also asked about when these dollars become available. Uh, I believe that all of these funds are available now. Um, however, the SDBG funds are still pending a final decision through the Dr. Cog Board and the Colorado Transportation Commission. As I mentioned, we expect uh, that to happen at their meetings in April. Uh, I answered the question about uh, additional points for overmatch. Um, I'm going to defer and come back to one of other Phil of one of other Phil's of Phil's questions at the end. Um, I addressed Steve Durian's question about federal aid eligible roadways. Uh, let's see. Steve Durian also asked a question about will CDOT have a process to determine what Senate Bill 267 projects will be selected and will local jurisdictions have input? Um, Steve, that input will happen through that review panel that will have a represent a staff representative from each of the eight Dr. Cog subregions. Uh, Tom Reef uh, asked a question that, according to the criteria, would interchange projects in interstate right of way be eligible for Senate Bill 267 funds? Um, I believe the answer is yes as long as it's not adding capacity to the interchange and as long as it's not an improvement to the highway, to the freeway itself, as long as it's an improvement to the uh, cross street at the interchange uh, to address a safety need. Uh, let's see, Tom asked about the high entry networks and where they can be found. I think I addressed that question and uh, you all will get an informational briefing later on the agenda from Beth on the Regional Vision Zero plan, uh, but that high injury network, um, as, it, as, as it's been identified in the Vision Zero plan, will be available uh, prior to the applications uh, being opened and, and uh, released for sponsors. Tom also had a question, and I will, um, I'll read this question, but I will defer to Paul Jositis, if he's still on the line to answer. The question is, regarding the state devolution criteria, it should only apply to the Senate Bill 267 funds because the SDBG funds are not required to be on the state highway system. 
I believe that is correct, Tom, but I will um, defer to Paul if you'd like to address that question. Uh, so, yeah. if, uh, this is Paul, can you hear me all right? Yes. Um, you know, just to uh, respond to devolution question, you know, first of all, it's not mandatory. It's just an opportunity if anybody wants to use it. And um, obviously it would only be uh, part of the Senate Bill 267 funds. Does that Thank answer you, your Paul. question? Thank you, Paul. Yep. Are there any other questions, Ron? Uh, Mr. Chair, those were all the written, I believe that I addressed all of the written questions that re we received in advance. Um, I have the um, staff recommendation for a motion uh, there to move to recommend to the Regional Transportation Committee the eligibility rules and process for, le for selecting projects to be funded through the Urban Arterial Multimodal Safety Improvement Program. Um, and I'd be happy to answer any additional questions that the committee has. Okay. Uh, are there any hands raised or chat box items that need to? There do? are three different folks that have sent in questions um, through the chat box. So I'll go through those and then Melinda can go through those with hands raised. So okay, thank we you. have one from, from Art and he says, we need to clarify that the devolution funds can be used for local match for a specific project, but devolution shouldn't be in the scoring. I would like to discuss removing devolution from the weighted scoring and we can certainly unmute art at any time um, just let us know okay um, mr chair this is ron i believe that's a question for cdot okay um, paul are you on on still i'll let you uh take an answer at that um give me just one second let me make sure he is yep he's still unmuted go ahead paul okay yeah hey uh, art thanks for your question um I do not believe that the devolution is part of the weighted scoring. So does that answer your question? Uh, if, looking forward, Art, go, go ahead and unmute Art so he can answer. Okay, Art, you're good. Yeah, I, I just was looking over the information that Ron presented and I thought where it talked about weighting, I thought that would turn into votes and I saw the word devolution there. I think it's a great opportunity to partner with CDOT to break out some funding, but I don't think it should be involved in the scoring and prioritization of the projects. I think it's an added bonus for those who apply for funding that they can use CDOT's devolution funds, but it shouldn't be scored. That's my comment. Okay, thank you, Art. Um, well, can I answer that um, question? Sure, Paul. Um, you know, my thought there is, uh, you know, and I don't have the points in front of me. My thoughts are there are a lot of ways to get points on these projects, and this is just one way that you could get points. Once again, I it, it certainly isn't a mandatory thing, and I'm not too concerned either way. Um, but I do think it's a good opportunity for the right project, um, and that's probably not most. So I, I don't know if that help, helps or or uh, answers your question. Okay. Um, let's let's move on to the other questions that you had in the chat box, and we can come back to that if need be. Sounds good. So Phil Greenwald is asking, does Region 4 have a seat on the STBG funding selection? Ron, do you know the answer to that? Uh, Mr. Chair, this is Ron Papsdorf again. Um, at this point, uh, CDOT, has, CDOT has only identified um, Region 1 DTR uh, staff to serve on the scoring and selection panel, and I believe uh, Paul can correct me, but I believe that resulted from CDOT's own internal communications. Okay, Paul. Hey, Ryan, can you repeat that question? I'm, I'm sorry, I don't understand what the question. Sorry, Paul. Uh, yeah, so the question the question was, um, does reg the CDOT Region 4 
um, have a role in the scoring and selection panel? Um, the answer to that is they are not on the panel with, I mean, we've established our five person panel and um, they are not on that panel. Um, so I guess the answer would be no. Paul, would it be would it be accurate to say that Region One will consult um, and involve Region Four in some way in the evaluation of projects that could get submitted for funding from the Region Four part of Dr. Cog? Yeah, I think that's fair. Um, I I wouldn't necessarily mind having them as an observer in the room on those projects. Um, I can certainly go back and talk to our team about that. They would they would certainly know those projects better than we would know. Put it that way. Right. Okay. Next question. All right, we have a couple more. Um, okay. The next question is from Brian. He says, since there looks to be a multiple multimodal accessibility goal of mobility and also safety, is there a percent of allocation between these different programs? Uh, Mr. Chair, this is Ron. Thank you for the question. Uh, there is not, there's, there's, there, we have not identified a specific split among the different types of projects. Uh, keep in mind, the primary, the primary objective of this funding program is to improve safety on arterial corridors throughout the region. So that's the that's obviously the primary purpose, which is why safety is uh, weighted higher than any other evaluation criteria. Um, but obviously, there are transit state transit funds involved in this as well as well. And we know that a lot of a significant amount of the safety problems, particularly uh, fatalities on the system, disproportionately impact. Uh, vulnerable users of the transportation system. So that's also reflected in the evaluation criteria. Thank you, Ron. Um, next question. All right, John Cotton asks, are grades separated bicycle facilities along CDOT highways eligible? Ron or Paul? Um, Mr. Chair, I, I believe that that would be an eligible um, use of, of the funds to grade separate uh, uh, pedestrian and bicycle users from the uh, roadway transportation system, assuming that it address um, a and was tied to a specific safety need. Okay, thank you. Any more chat box questions, comments? I have just one right now and it's from Deborah Basket and she would like to provide input regarding the project and project component examples on page 38 of the packet. So with that, I would suggest we unmute Deborah. That um, would so be she fine. Can provide that input. Please. Oh, well, so thank you very much for the preparation that went into this. It happened rapidly and I find it to be pretty clear. Uh, the only thing that struck me when I read through the box on page 38 project and project component examples is in the third bullet, traffic calming, road diets, complete street improvements, and speed reduction measures. I, I would like to suggest that road diets is not a constructive term and not something we want to perpetuate in our vernacular. Um, my training has been that it has a very negative implication to people that if you need to go on a diet, it means there's something wrong with you. So I think we're just deleting that and staying with traffic calming and complete streets in the context and speed reduction measures um, conveys the message necessary. Ron, do you yeah, like thank to respond? You, Karen. Deborah, thank you for the question and the comment. I, I uh, don't have any objection to removing the term road diet uh, from, the, uh, from the examples of potential project and project component components in the in the document so I'd be um, would not have any objection if um, that amendment was included in a in a motion to approve okay, thank you Ron thank you do we Deborah did you have any additional comments no thank you thank you um, are there any with their hands raised that we need to address um, so I'm seeing 
Uh, Brian Weimer and John Cotton, I know you, you both typed in questions. Um, if you have additional questions, then um, obviously we'll unmute you uh, when it's your turn. Otherwise, I would ask that you put your hand down so we can keep everything rolling. Okay, so I do see a hand raise from Art Griffith, so I will go ahead and unmute him now. Okay, thank you. Yes, um, I would like to move to recommend to the RTC the eligibility rules and process for selecting projects to be funded through the Urban Arterial Multimodal Safety Improvements Program with a friendly motion from Deborah Basket to remove the road diet. Okay, it's been moved by Art. Um, is there a second? Um, I do see, uh, let's see, I do see a second from John Cotton. Okay, go ahead and unmute him. Okay, give me one moment. Okay, sorry about that, John, you are, oh, hold on, technical difficulties. Uh, it says he's self-muted. Um, I have unmuted him on our end. So, John, I'm mute on your end, and it should work. You there, John? Okay, um, um, I am, it's still showing on our end that he's muted, and I have unmuted him on our end. I'm not sure what's going on. Okay. We also have another hand from Deborah if we want to unmute her. Yeah, that'd be great. Yep, let me get that. Okay, Deborah, you're good. Go ahead, Deborah. Uh, to, I'll, I'll second the motion. Okay, thank you. Is there any additional discussion? Um, are there any hands up? Uh, I do see a hand up from Brian again. So, Brian, okay. I will go ahead and unmute. Oh, looks like he put his hand down, so I'm assuming we've answered his question. <laughs> okay. All right. So, um, hearing no more questions or chat box, uh, we'll move forward. Oh, Deborah the... has her hand up. Sorry. Okay. Go ahead, Deborah. I'm sorry. I was trying to put my hand down. Was... <laughs> okay. Sorry. All right. Okay, so we'll go ahead and do the vote, and it should be uh, uh, on there. So if you'll go ahead and vote and submit it. And how are we doing on the vote? We have 21 people that have voted and they all are voting in favor. Okay. All right. We'll give it here another 15 seconds and then we'll uh, move forward if we don't have any more votes. All right, we have 22 all in favor. Okay, 22, all right. Thank you, and thank you for your uh, patience on the voting on this um, a portion of the of the meeting. We will um, next move on to informational briefings by uh, on the draft 2050 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan scenario outcome results, and I believe Jacob has um, Rieger has that presentation. So thank Jacob, you, Mr. Chair. Go ahead. Yep, thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, this is Jacob Rieger, uh, Long Range Transportation Planning Manager at Dr. Cog. Hopefully you all can hear me and see my screen. Um, so this is item six, attachment D of our packet. This is an informational item. Uh, a couple logistical things about this item. Uh, for those of you that have had a chance to look through the packet, you'll realize there is a tremendous amount of information that we're about to present. So as we go through this presentation, um, there are kind of pause points in the presentation for questions. I think logistically it'll work better to keep most questions to the end, um, but we did want to put some pause points in case there are questions along the way. Uh, we also appreciated everyone who submitted questions ahead of time, uh, just like with the other items that really helps on this one. 
So most of those questions we will also save till the end, but a few of them we will we will try and answer as we go through the presentation. So with that, uh, first slide everyone should see is the project schedule. This is just kind of a general reminder of where we are in the overall development of the 2050 uh, MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. Uh, next slide, scenario planning process. Um, again, most folks have seen this slide before. A uh, little bit of a reminder here of, again, where we are sort of in this, in this piece of the work of uh, developing and testing uh, scenarios. Next slide, understanding relationships. Um, really, this is just to make the point, um, again, as a reminder of what are we doing here with scenarios? What is, what is the point of this? And the ultimate point is really to explore these relationships, understand these relationships between urban form, our multimodal transportation system, and travel and mobility patterns. So, and we'll see that in the results today. When we made certain assumptions on A, B, and C, uh, we got X, Y, Z type of results. So it's really, again, to understand the very complex relationships going on here between land use, uh, transportation, and, and through the model, how people sort of respond in terms of their travel and mobility outcomes. Uh, next slide, Dr. Cog's approach. Um, again, many of you have seen this, but just to, as a reminder to set the context, uh, for presenting the results today. This really is sort of that conceptual planning exercise. We're looking at what if alternative futures. Um, the, we're, you're gonna see some relative comparisons between scenarios and baselines, and we'll, we'll define those in the next few slides. Uh, this is not a rigorous evaluation of scenarios. We are not choosing or judging scenarios. Uh, we're not picking a particular scenarios, and we're not directly sort of picking projects from these scenarios. However, in going through these results today, what we do want to do is set up uh, what I think will be an, a really interesting and, and frankly a little bit of a challenging conversation about choices and trade-offs from the results that we see today. Uh, we're going to see some pretty interesting, um, even fascinating results from this scenario work today, um, and we're going to use that as a launch point for having further conversations about what does it mean, what are the implications as we move forward uh, to preparing the 2050 Regional Transportation Plan. Let me take a second to expand on that point. Given the volume of information that we're about to present today, um, really the goal for today's conversation, again, this is just an informational item, but really we just want all of us to both absorb and hopefully understand uh, the plethora of results that we're gonna have uh, through these scenario results at this meeting. Uh, we intend to have a similar conversation with our board uh, in their work session on April 1st. And then at the April TAC meeting, that's where we wanna have part two of the conversation to you know, once we've digested all these results, to have that conversation about what are the implications uh, for moving forward. And we'll get to that later in this presentation. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Alvin, to start going through uh, the scenarios that we tested. Alvin? Thanks, Jacob. So for our scenario analysis, we looked at two components, a land use component and a transportation component. On both of them, they're compared against a 2050 base, in the land use side, we have two scenarios that we're testing against the 2050 base, an infill scenario and a center scenario. On the transportation side, we're looking at five scenarios, the off-peak congestion, managed lanes and operations, travel choices, transit, and automated and connected vehicles. Those are being compared against a 2050 base transportation scenario. Uh, I will note when we say 2050 base, we mean our 2040 fiscally constrained regional transportation plan. Uh, and I'll go into that uh, in a couple slides. In addition to comparing each of these scenarios against their base, uh, we also combined a couple, so you'll see that in a few slides as well. We know the Dr. Cog region is going to continue to grow. Our projections for 2050 show uh, an additional 1 million people in the Dr. Cog region, and then similarly, we're seeing an extra 800,000 jobs in the region. This data has been uh, consistently used through the scenarios, so these same population projections and employment projections are used to run each of the scenario scenario runs you're going to see in the upcoming slides. Next slide. Once we get into the actual outcomes and comparisons of each of the scenarios, we're going to be showing you three metrics. One is vehicle miles traveled, the other is transit walk and bicycle trips, and the final is vehicle hours of delay. Uh, we wanted to introduce them to you here so you can see where we are right now in 2020 and where we're projecting to be in 2050. Uh, as with our population and employment projections, we're expecting each of these to increase out to 2050. I will note that on these, you're seeing these values represented as raw numbers and values. Once we get into the actual comparison and outcomes with each scenario run, you'll see those become percentage changes. 
So just be aware of that difference once we get into the actual runs. Next slide. Now I mentioned the 2050 base transportation scenario was our 2040 fiscally constrained regional transportation plan. So by that we mean it is the funded capacity projects, our roadway capacity projects and our rapid transit system projects that are currently in our 2040 Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. So the adopted 2040 plan that we have is what we mean by our 2050 base, and it's just our way of referencing our future horizon year of 2050. Next slide. And, and Alvin, sorry, let me jump in and answer a couple questions about sort of this notion of a transportation base that we received. Um, Kent Mormon asked a question uh, regarding this slide. Uh, the meaning of the 2050 base is I believe it was just a reference point and not an approved 2050 base project. So just to be clear, again, when we say transportation base and our 2050 base on the transportation side, what we're referring to is our 2040, our adopted 2040 fiscally constrained regional transportation plan. Um, and these are the maps that show the fiscally constrained roadway and rapid transit projects in that plan. The only difference is that for purposes of comparison with the other scenarios and given that um, this work that we're doing is for our 2050 plan, um, we did run the adopted 2040 fiscally constrained plan with uh, the 2050 base land use that we used in the other scenarios just to have a, a 2050 base as a starting point. That's the only change. Otherwise, we're using our adopted plan. Um, similarly, we had another question about the base from Tom Reese in Castle Rock. Why is there a separate automated connected vehicle scenario? This technology is not a maybe, it's coming and should be included in the base model. Um, so Tom, that's a good comment. Uh, we don't disagree in concept, but the reason for not including it here, you'll actually see it um, in several slides. We do have a section on automated and connected vehicles, so I hope that'll kind of help illustrate how we're dealing with it. Um, but we wanted to sort of preserve our adopted plan as sort of the base. We didn't want to start making changes based on assumptions that uh, we frankly don't know yet. Yes, we know this technology is coming, but we don't know to what magnitude, and that's part of what we'll get in in a few slides. So we didn't want to start making additional assumptions assumptions or changes to the base. So we've again perverse, preserved the base of our 2040 adopted plan run with 2050 land use. Uh, thanks, Alvin, go ahead. Thanks, Jacob, you can go to the next slide. So I mentioned that we weren't just comparing our individual scenarios against their respective bases, we were also combining land use and transportation. So we did take our 2050 base land use scenario and we combined that with our with our 2050 base transportation scenario and then our off-peak congestion, managed lanes and operations, travel choices, and transit scenarios. And then we also took our two new land use scenarios and compared those to our 2050 base transportation scenario. And then we combined our infill scenario with our travel choices scenario and our center scenario with our transit scenario. You'll see uh, each of these in the upcoming slides and their comparison across those three metrics I previously mentioned. Next slide. Okay, so um, at this point, let's pause for any initial questions. Um, as I said at the beginning, I think it would be helpful logistically if we held most questions to the end, but given the length of this presentation, we wanted to make this our first pause point uh, for any questions, if there are any. Okay. Uh, Melinda and Emily, this is Kent. Uh, do you have any questions or hands raised or questions in the chat box? There are no uh, questions in the chat box. Okay. No, no <laughs> and questions. Then I will in the give hand raised. Okay. So let's go ahead and go to the person with the hand raised. Okay. It looks like it is Rick Pilgrim. And Rick, I will unmute you now. Go ahead. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Jacob, um, on, on the uh, performance metrics, if we're going to have uh, uh, trips by mode that's available uh would we want to have a person trip uh tr miles traveled or a person trip hours traveled would, would that be that that might be as helpful as as vehicle miles traveled or vehicle hours traveled um it gets more to the impact on the individual and especially as we get into a more uh, diverse modal choice program that might be of interest. Yeah, good question, Rick. Thanks. Let me start an answer and I might call on Robert to assist me. But um, in a nutshell, as we go through these results, Rick, you're going to see as we get into the results of each scenario, you're, you're going to see um, some of the statistics by mode. 
Um, so you'll see sort of the VMT, but you'll also see uh, transit ridership and other modes. One of the reasons that we focus on VMT is that that is one of our primary MetroVision uh, target objectives. So we do want to have that to relate back to MetroVision. Um, Robert, do you want to add any, any additional thoughts to that? Sure. Um, you know, I would say there is a, a handout table in the in the TAC packet as well. It has a lot more detail about individual things like PMT, PhD. Um, the other thing is, you know, we kind of struggled with how to represent this data in both a slide and uh, eventually a document. You know, there's high level things, but in a way, VMT represents so many aspects of all of our targets and from emissions and SOVs. Um, so the, we're kind of looking at these three as kind of the ones that we saw kind of as proxy represented a lot of things we care about, um, but they're, they are certainly not all inclusive and we try to tell some individual stories for these scenarios separately. Okay, thanks. Thanks, Robert. Thanks. Are there any additional questions at this point? Any more hands raised, I, Melinda? I do not see any, so I think we're good to continue. Okay, okay. go ahead, Jacob. So let's keep going. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Okay, um, so I so think these next set of slides, oh, is this still you, Alvin? I, I was just gonna say that the first part of the presentation, uh, we're gonna hand off to Robert and he's gonna show us the combinations and the outcomes from our combinations with our base land use scenario and then each of these transportation scenarios. Okay, great, thanks, Alvin. Um, yeah, so th these uh, first four that we're gonna take a look at are keeping our base land use and then uh, altering the transportation network and some other components within our travel model. So the first one we're looking at, this was the concept of the off-peak congestion scenario. Um, we took a stab at evaluating which are the most congested um, corridors or freeways during the off-peak hours. So we expect congestion during the peak pretty much no matter what. Um, and we landed on what if we uh, widened with one general pur extra general purpose lane in each direction, all of I-25 from E470 to C470, along with 270, and then did some pretty major interchange reconstructions at four really significant bottleneck um, locations in the region. So actually in terms of scale, this is relatively small in terms of infrastructure compared to some of the other ones. That said, this is obviously a major, major um, construction project. Uh, Mac Callison asked the question of whether this was even possible to do given the existing built environment. And I uh, just want to stress again that this is, every one of these scenarios is really ambitious um, with potentially expensive investments. We're really just kind of testing concepts here. Next slide. So, you know, this is just one corridor we're altering. Um, and at the end of the day, the model um, estimated that there's kind of not much change at all in vehicle miles traveled or transit trips, um, less than 1% impact. Obviously, that I-25 corridor in particular, if you look at the numbers in that table there, significant changes in terms of both the volume and the, and the speed. You know, either way, even with the widening, um, we're in the off-peak congestion scenario, still takes longer to travel that corridor than today. But you're talking about an extra 120,000 vehicles on the road compared to today. Compared with the 2050 base, you can see there is a lot of additional volume, uh, 50,000 additional cars every day, and yet the travel time is less. Um, so, you know, with that additional volume, it's kind of diverting some traffic from arterial uh, roads surrounding it. Um, Mac again asked what, what corridors were impacted and, you know, we would assume it's, it's most of these north-south type of corridors where I, the extra capacity in I-25 is assisting. So um, regional delay did go down a little bit in this scenario. And Jacob, you can go to the next slide. So as Alvin mentioned, um, we're not looking at raw values here. We're looking at what changed from 2020 today in 2050 in the, both the base and the, compared to the scenario. So for example, if you were looking at vehicle hours of delay, the base delay increases by 98%. That's about doubling the amount of delay that we experience today. So this scenario, you know, not much change at all in VMT or transit walk bike trips. But I-25 is a, you know, a huge portion of the congestion today, that entire corridor. So that, you know, congestion regionally didn't increase quite as significantly. Next slide. 
All right, second uh, scenario we're looking at here is managed lanes and operations. So this is essentially building out the entire HPTE Express Lanes Master Plan. This is a massive amount of infrastructure, 325 additional lane miles. All of these have direct connect, so you can go straight for if you're changing freeways, you can switch from one freeway to the other, staying in that HOT lane. Um, and then other assumptions about improved operations and incident management, assuming fewer crashes and um, better roadside assistance, things like that, it would increase the capacity on all freeways relative to today. Next slide. So as you might expect with that much capacity, um, we people in vehicles do experience a significant decrease in delay. That's all users, including the people that are on bus, buses. Um, and then, you know, additionally with that additional capacity, a decent increase in VMT as well, a 3% increase, you know, just to put a number on it, it's about 800,000 additional daily VMT. Um, one of the other benefits that we can't directly model, but um, we would assume a much greater amount of reliability as um, the HOT lane does um, provide for an uncongested option, and then um, fewer secondary crashes and safety. And next slide. So as you can see, VMT increased a tick from where we were in uh, the 2050 base. Transit walk and bike trips went down a little bit, as you might expect. The vehicle hours delay significant decrease compared to where the 2050 base was. Next slide. All right, this introducing the travel choices scenario. So this is essentially um, lowering speeds on several urban arterials, uh, both Eileen Yazzie and Matt Callison asked, uh, what did we do to the bike ped network? We don't actually directly model or assign, I should say, the bike and walk trips onto a network. We do have um, several kind of proxy measures, including the density of walk and bike facilities within every zone. And so what we did is basically doubled the um, density in every zone in the region. And that's not to say we would double the actual um, mileage of roadways, but it, it, it um, implies you know, new, new facilities, but also just kind of better connectivity, better access, better safety impacts. Um, and then in terms of lowering speeds, we manually, we have a speed table in the model and it's basically a speed is assigned to every uh, facility type by area type. So we went through and manually changed those values. Um, lots of those like 25, 30 mile an hours went down to you know, 20 or so. So we, we, we talked to Beth who's running our Vision Zero project and um, made educated decreases in speed, keeping in mind um, safety of the most vulnerable users. We also um, incentivized people to telework more um, in this scenario and other forms of TDM. Next slide. So we ended up with about twice as many teleworkers and that's what's really gonna move the needle in terms of VMT in this um, scenario, 400,000 fewer drive alone work trips every day. It's a really significant decrease in those trips. Sounds very familiar today. Uh, and then the, uh, you know really big increase in bike ped trips as well. So again, um, we're not modeling this stuff directly but we all would anticipate much safer environment for bike and peds. And you know, even though we did reduce speed limits significantly throughout the region, there's um, you know less total delay by getting those people those vehicles off the roadway. Next slide. So pretty significant decrease in VMT growth compared to the 2050 base, doubling the growth of transit walk and bike trips, and really a, a significant decrease in delay considering there's not really additional capacity on the roadway network. Next slide. Final one I'll introduce is transit scenario. This is a really significant um, increase in our transit service, about eight times as many service hours. This scenario, we completed all of fast tracks and then some additional miles of rail, an extensive busted rapid transit network. This is based on RTD's BRT network. You can see all the lines where we added BRT in red there. Matt Callison asked if we um, were removing lanes when we're adding these BRT um, uh, corridors and we did not for this exercise remove lanes we just added the potential of a bus going faster than traffic essentially um thomas reef asked about busting and whether we're incorporating that we did we added um transit all the way to our northern um, external stations 
and southern and eastern and western. So buses go all the way down south to the southern border of Douglas County. Um, we also included free fares and uh, improved station and stop access. So this is a significant infrastructure and um, increase in service hours in this scenario. And next slide. So as you might expect, that resulted in a much larger percentage of households having really good transit access to jobs. That's a me measure we keep track of in our RTP. Um, and it resulted in you know 76% more transit trips. It actually decreased walk and bike trips a little bit as some of those were converted into transit trips. And then about 100,000 more households ended up using transit. That's 14% of all households in the region in this scenario. You know, there's other benefits here where uh, free transit could provide personal mobility and equity. However, saying all that, uh, VMT actually only decreased by about 2%. Um, and really quickly, Eileen Yazi noted that that um, all this service, and we just decreased our VMT by 2%. Um, and her, her question really was about what happens when we add the land use um, scenarios. And we will get to that later, Eileen. We'll, um, we could, did combine those in a later scenario. So next slide. So small decrease in VMT, you know, pretty decent increase in transit walk and bike trips. Um, and then delay does go down uh, a little bit here. Next slide. And again. So to take a break here, look at these uh, four scenarios, um, just comparing them to some of our MetroVision targets here. That orange line represents what our MetroVision target is currently set at. And as you can see, uh, none of these scenarios got us here in our to, to reach our goal of reducing daily vehicle miles traveled per capita. Next slide. Another one we have is reducing the single occupancy vehicle mode share to work. MetroVision target here is 65%. Again, none of these um, really moved the needle significantly in getting us towards those that target. And next slide. This is, um, I guess, it's probably a slightly easier target to reach. It's uh, reducing the amount that, that uh, Delay will increase, I guess. So, you know, none of these scenarios have less delay than today, but uh, especially the managed lanes and operations scenario, met, it met the MetroVision target as well as just having a slight increase in the daily hour person delay per capita. Next slide. Okay. Um, we can pause for uh, any questions. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Robert. Do we have any questions at this point? I would ask. Yeah. Uh, Emily, do you have any questions? Yes, Chat, there are two please. questions. So okay. The first one is from Phil Greenwald. For the managed lane and off scenario, where State Highway 119, State Highway 7, State Highway 42 included as BRT or managed lanes? So we could go back to that map, maybe, Jacob. Yeah. So we, we really just did a you know freeways only in this um, scenario for managed lanes. Um, I believe State Highway 119 is already included in the fiscally constrained plan though, is that correct? It is. Did I miss any part of that question, Emily? I think you got it. We do have another question though. Okay. In the travel choices scenario, how much of the decrease in delay was due to telecommuting, as telecommuting could be a component to every scenario being evaluated? And that came in from Art Griffith. Yeah, Art, that's a that's a great comment. I mean, you know, we're kind of testing these concepts in a way individually, um, but certainly telecommuting could easily be part of any of these scenarios and is likely to be. Um, so I would say that the telecommuting part probably had the most significant impact on regional metrics, especially taking that extra load off during peak travel times. Um, so yes, significant impact of teleworking um, and could be part of every scenario. Okay, any other questions at this point? Melinda, did you have any with hands up? I do, I have one uh, that just 
popped up. It's Rick Pilgrim. And Rick, I will unmute you right now. Thanks, Melinda. Go ahead, Rick. Um, it, this is terrific information. And I'm, uh, I'm kind of fascinated, Robert, you made the comment about um, the travel choices kind of related to the current situation. Um, does Dr. Cog have any plans to take some measurements out on the system right now and uh, make some comparison with the fact that most of us are working from home? It's kind of uh, tangential to the program, but yeah. You know, I did. We have access through uh, to edit to NRAX data through CDOT. Um, I looked earlier or late last week, um, just comparing the last four Wednesdays on I-25 that uh, pretty much the the, belt, the corridor from C-470 to E-470 and uh, basically rush hour was gone. It was just pretty much gone. Speeds did not decrease at all throughout the entire day. Of course, we're not talking about just teleworking here. We're talking about uh, very significant impacts to the economy. Nobody's going shopping, nobody's going out to restaurants. So it's it's not yeah. exactly the future we uh, envision here. <laughs> yeah, true. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, and I guess similarly, we also got a similar question from Kent Mormon. Um, do you think teleworking will increase after the current emergency is over as employers and employees get comfortable with this mode of work? And if so, will we have data in time to implement into the 2050 and the RTP? Um, so Kent, it's a good question. The short answer I can give you is that I don't think we know yet. Um, I think we're still on the front end of our current situation of world events. Um, so I don't think anyone knows where we're going yet. I would ask, you know, keep in mind that we're looking at, at 2050 in this work, right? So you know, what may change from today that will endure for literally 30 years. And I just, I don't think we know that yet. I think we're seeing in these results sort of the power of telecommuting and, and the ability of telecommuting to move the needle a little bit. So it's something that we need to think about, um, particularly for our conversation in April. Um, but no, I don't, I don't think that any of us know just yet where this, how much of this might last over time. Okay. Thank you, Jacob. Is there any additional questions or hands up? Uh, I don't have any more hands up, no. Okay. Okay. So let's keep going. I'm going to turn this part of the presentation over to Andy Taylor with our land use team to talk through the land use scenarios. Thank you, Jacob. Um, we'll go ahead and get started here. On uh, the next slide, uh, as Alvin already mentioned, um, we kept for all of our scenarios related to land use the same number of households that we're adding through 2050 and the same number of jobs through 2050. So what Alvin showed on back on slide seven uh, quite a while ago, uh, that should stay um, the same through all the, all the scenarios. Um, we also have all the scenarios that we're about to show you, they're all anchored to local zoning and permitted plats. So what this means is that it, since one of the scenarios assumes uh, an increase in capacity uh, for jobs or housing, um, that increase is done relative to what's in place now. So an increase in capacity in Denver or Castle Rock, for example, would look very different um, based on what's the capacity for uh, households or employment growth uh, today uh, based on current zoning. We also are assuming that the scheduled development data that we've been uh, accumulating about approved plats is included in all the scenarios in the same way. Uh, that's a result in about 200,000 units being uh, just assumed as part of all the scenarios we're about to show you. Um, that's a significant chunk of the household growth uh, that, we're that we're projecting. Uh, so that is to try and add some realism to uh, what we're sharing, that we're not asking anyone to, to yank away anything that's been approved in, as in place uh, in that way. Uh, also, we made no changes to the predictive parts of the urban sim model. Uh, it remains calibrated the same way throughout all of the scenarios. Next slide. Uh, we introduce change by assuming uh, that different location choices are available. Uh, what that means is assuming more or less capacity for housing and jobs than current zoning. Uh, so uh, the infill and center scenarios focus on different areas uh, that you'll see in the next slides, but they're all uh, sourced from uh, language that's straight out of uh, MetroVision itself. So uh, our region, uh, just for reference, is about the size of Connecticut spatially. Uh, however, 
according to the Census Bureau, what they consider to be urban or really uh, non-rural is only about 15% of that space. So when we're talking about the infill areas, we're looking at areas that some may call urban or inner suburban. And the question that we're asking is, what if local governments were to allow for more urban and suburban redevelopment and infill? And the area that we're looking at is only about 11% of the region's land area. In terms of centers, uh, the, the, we're looking at uh, a much more intense uh, intensification uh, that local governments would focus opportunity for development around uh, key centers and corridors. Uh, these include our rapid transit stations, uh, urban centers that have already been uh, locally identified and regionally designated through MetroVision. There's 105 of them in 26 different local governments. And we also looked at different employment centers that are existing today. Altogether, that's only about 3% of the region's land area. And so that's a really uh, focused area uh, for this uh, scenario itself. Next slide. The results of making these different choices available, uh, the infill uh, area captures about three quarters of household growth to increase its share of total households. Uh, think of this like market share. The market is growing uh, and the share is growing uh, at the same time. Uh, the centers area is a much smaller geography. It captures less than a fifth of all households to start, but captures nearly two thirds of all the growth in households. Uh, while that 37% total share that results might not seem like a large share of households, it ref reflects a significant focusing of development activity. So next slide. Um, these just step through uh, what that looks like, where the household growth is happening uh, throughout the region in all scenarios. These maps illustrate where the most intense activity would be occurring. Uh, they do not... Uh, reflect all of the growth. So there is our, there would be growth happening throughout the region. Uh, this is just showing areas where there'd be uh, more intense growth, the darker the color, the more intense the growth. Alone, each map might not reveal much insight about where growth is happening. However, if you let yourself um, identify one area between the different ones and compare them back to the baseline forecast, you can begin to see uh, some of the differences. However, I think uh, also some of the numbers uh, when we start comparing these scenarios may even be more illustrative of the differences. Next slide. Comparing the scenarios shows that they are progressively more dense. Uh, they're more uh, centers focused. Uh, so these first uh, three metrics here are ones that are straight out of MetroVision uh, itself. MetroVision had a 2040 target for regional population weighted density. This is simply a weighted average that areas that have currently have a higher population and will have a higher population, uh, they count more towards uh, the density calculation. And so what we see is that more people are moving to areas that already have a high population uh, throughout these scenarios. We also see that uh, the households and jobs are capturing a larger percentage of all total regional households and all total jobs uh, in just those urban centers. This is not just what we were focusing on in the centers. Uh, this is one part of the centers uh, scenario itself. Um, we fall short of the MetroVision target, but the MetroVision target always had assumed that there would possibly be more uh, station areas or other areas that could get identified and designated as urban centers. So it makes sense that we may fall short, but the center's uh, focus does come closest. Uh, if you could show the remainder of that. Um, we also wanted to look at a couple other things that aren't necessarily metrics straight out of MetroVision itself. Um, folks have opportunities to locate closer to one of the top 10 regional employment centers. In the baseline, new households our household growth is locating almost six miles away from one of those employment centers. In the infill, the opportunities are much closer and, and the center is extremely uh, closer to one of these employment centers. That's not saying that that household itself would be working in that employment center, but it is saying that the opportunity of being closer to an employment center would be there for a lot more of the household growth. Uh, we also see uh, in terms of areas that are able to remain um, 
predominantly single family that are remaining within that range of development intensity, that actually the center's scenario fares the best in terms of uh, allowing areas to remain single family and focusing development uh, in areas uh, that aren't currently single family. And also uh, the households that are in the highest range of development intensity, we're showing that the centers is just really trying to add a lot of households through the most intense uh, 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 level of development that we analyzed. Okay, so let's go ahead and pause for questions there. Thank you very much, Andy. Yeah. Do we have any additional questions at this point? Emily, do you have any in the chat box? I have none in the chat box. Melinda? Uh, I am not seeing any hands raised. If that's the case, let's move on, Jacob. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I'll do this next slide, the scenario combination. So given what Andy just presented on the two land use scenarios, we wanted to we wanted to pair the two land use scenarios with the most sort of appropriate or what seemed kind of logical transportation scenarios. So for the infill land use scenario, we paired that uh, with the baseline. We did that for both and with the travel choices scenario. Similarly, the centers we did with the baseline, but we did the centers with the transit scenario. And we're going to step you through what some of that starts looking like. So again, on the infill scenario, what if local governments allow for more urban suburban redevelopment and infill um, consistent with, with how Andy just described this scenario? And there's the map as the, as the reminder. So what do we see when we just run this against the base? And again, we're comparing to the 2050 base. So just with the infill lane use scenario, no transportation scenarios yet, we see a 6% decrease in vehicle miles of travel. Uh, people in vehicles experience 11% less delay on average, and we have almost twice as many transit trips, as well as a 50% increase in walk and bike trips. Um, as we also note on this slide, that a range of housing options across the region you know, can benefit individuals and families and can improve the economic vitality and diversity of local communities. So that's something to keep in mind. Uh, we also noted that commercial vehicle trips decrease with consolidation of stops. So we might expect that in an infill scenario, um, where we're focusing things just a little bit uh, together, um, that we should see that benefit on the commercial vehicle side. Um, so when we look at the change from 2020, uh, comparing with the 2050 base in the infill scenario, we see that vehicle miles travel, uh, the growth in vehicle miles travel decreases um, a little bit, um, but transit, walk, and bicycle trips, you know, increase quite significantly, and the growth in vehicle hours of delay uh, decreases a little bit compared to 2050 base. So now we took the infill lane use scenario and we paired it with the travel choices scenario. Um, again, the travel choices scenario is a reminder of is increasing travel and mobility choices along the region's major arterials, sort of a safety uh, multimodal complete street scenario. So in this sort of pairing of these two uh, scenarios, the lane use and transportation, we're allowing for more housing and jobs in existing urban and inner suburban areas. And we're pairing that with active transportation being encouraged through better infrastructure and lower speeds on high activity urban arterials. And as we've discussed in previous slides, telecommuting and other transportation demand management strategies. So when we put these two together, and again, compared to the 2050 base, vehicle miles travel decreases by 14.5 million each day. It's 11% less VMT compared to the 2050 base. We also saw twice as many walking and bicycling trips about 16% of all trips taken in the region. Um, we also note here that there's more transit trips than in the transit scenario. So here's what some of that looks like visually, again, compared with 2050 base, this combination of the infill land use scenario and the travel choices transportation scenario. Uh, we see a decrease in the growth of vehicle miles travel compared to 2050 base but a significant increase in transit walk and bicycle trips, and a pretty significant decrease in vehicle hours of delay, which again, just like the original travel choices scenario is pretty significant, uh, given that there really isn't a lot of capacity uh, in this scenario. 
So we wanted to break this down just a little bit and tell the story of, you know, now that we're starting to do this sort of multi-factor analysis or multivariate analysis, we wanted to kind of break down, you know, the progression of how things are changing based on the inputs that we're adding. So the two charts that you see on this slide, uh, the gray is the 2050 base, the greenish color is the travel choices scenario by itself. Then we have the infill land use scenario in orange by itself. And then in blue, the infill and travel choices scenario uh, together. So you can see for both vehicle miles traveled and for transit walk and bicycle trips, you can see sort of the progression of what happens when you start layering these things or combining these things together. So let me pause for questions um, on that section. Emily, do you have any in the chat room? I don't have any in the chat box. Uh, Melinda, do you have any hands raised? I am currently not seeing any hands raised, no. Okay. Proceed forward, Jacob. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So now let's talk about the center scenario. So again, in center scenario, what if local governments focus opportunity for development around those key centers and corridors that Andy talked about earlier? Again, remember this is about only 3% of our total land area. It's a very strategically focused um, scenario. And again, there's the map to remind you of, of what that looks like. So again, just like with the infill scenario, we first ran the, cent the center scenario by itself, not in combination with anything else. We just ran it by itself, comparing to the 2050 base. Um, as you see, we saw an 8% decrease in vehicle miles traveled just from this land use scenario. Uh, we saw over three times as many transit trips compared to the 2050 base and over twice as many uh, walk and bicycle trips in this scenario. Um, and as we note here, sort of at the bottom, connected urban centers across the region accommodate a growing share of the region's housing and employment and support existing neighborhoods. So this gets back to uh, sort of the anchoring and metro vision that Andy talked about earlier. And then we also note that average person delay per trip decreases by 27%. That said, and that's across the region, some localized areas do experience more congestion. So looking at this sort of uh, graphically, visually, um, change from 2020, comparing the center's land use scenario with the 2050 base, um, the growth in vehicle miles traveled uh, decreases a little bit compared to 2050 base. Uh, transit walk and bicycle trips increase very significantly, as you see, and vehicle hours of delay um, the growth in vehicle hours of delay um, decreases compared to the 2050 base. So now we took the center's land use scenario and ran it in combination with the transit scenario. And again, a reminder of the transit scenario, improving and expanding the region's transit network and services. So in this combination on the land use side, focusing housing and jobs around the key centers and corridors. Um, also the cost of driving and parking increases significantly. Um, and we'll show you that as we as we step through the numbers on this one. We did that in combination with completing fast tracks and the additional miles of rail that Robert talked about earlier, as well as the extensive BRT network from RTD's regional BRT study that we showed earlier, and free fares and improved uh, station and stop access. Oops. So when you run these together, um, again, the center's land use scenario and the transit transportation scenario, again, compared to the 2050 base, Vehicle miles of travel decreased 24%. We had three times as many walk and bicycle trips. We had six times as many transit trips. That's 2.4 million transit trips daily. Um, we also note that there's more total person trips since there's more free time for short trips and that people in vehicles experience 50% less delay on average. So again, looking at this graphically, Again, compared um, centers, centers and transit scenarios run together with the 2050 base. Um, you see the vehicle miles travel um, decreased uh, pretty significantly. Uh, the transit walk and bicycle trips increased almost exponentially in this scenario, as you might expect when you have a transit scenario and a center's land use you know, sort of compatible scenario. Um, you expect to see very significant increase in transit walk and bike trips. And then vehicle hours of delay actually decreased uh, quite significantly in this scenario. So just with the other combination, uh, we wanted to kind of walk you through the constituent pieces of this. So again, we're looking at the 2050 base, the transit scenario by itself, the center's land use scenario by itself, 
the centers and transit scenario run together in the light blue. And then the centers and the transit uh, scenario along with sort of the uh, vehicle costs that we talked about. We did get a question about um, what does cost mean? Uh, Matt Callison asked in the centers plus transit plus cost scenario category. They're basically the additional auto operating and parking costs um, that we that we have in the focus model. So we wanted to we wanted to sort of break that out just a little bit so that you could see the sort of constituent amount of change from that variable along with the other variables here. So when you put all of these together, as you see the vehicle miles traveled, um, the growth uh, compared to the 2050 base, um, you know, goes down significantly. Um, and sort of conversely, transit, white, transit walk and bicycle trips increase exponentially significantly in this combination of scenarios. So let me talk through these at the MetroVision targets and then we'll pause for uh, questions on this section. So the land use and transportation scenarios, how do they compare with our MetroVision targets? So when we look at our target of reducing daily vehicle miles traveled per capita, um, again, the orange line is the MetroVision target of 23 uh, per day, VMT per capita uh, per day. Um, you can see that uh, these scenarios start either getting us closer to meeting that target or in the case of the centers and transit scenario, um, actually help us um, exceed the target in terms of meeting the target. Um, another MetroVision target, reducing single occupant vehicle mode share to work. Uh, so our MetroVision target here is 65%. Um, and you can see that several of these scenarios actually either get us there or do better than getting us to that target. Uh, the center scenario, the infill and travel choices, and the centers and transit scenarios all get us there on this target. Uh, and then finally, uh, minimizing increase of daily person delay per capita. Um, again, as Robert explained earlier, this is one of those that we know it's going to increase over time. Our MetroVision target is to have that increase be less than it otherwise would be, so less than nine minutes. Um, and you can see that most of the, uh, actually all of the scenario combinations here um, have us meet or do better than this MetroVision target. And so with that, let me pause for questions again, Mr. Chair. Okay. Um, Melinda, any with their hands up? I am not seeing any hands up. Emily, any in the chat box? There are two. All right, if you'd go ahead and read them. Sounds good. The first one is from Brian, and he asks, what are the assumptions made on housing costs with the center and infill land use scenarios? Andy, could you address that? Um, there are no assumptions made related to housing costs. That's something that happens inside the model to help place different households. There's no, um, we didn't compare how those uh, performed in terms of housing costs or anything like that. Um, obviously, there there could very well be some impacts to that, but that's not something that um, necessarily something that could be derived uh, directly from our model. Okay. Thank you, Andy. Is um, what's the next question? The next one is from Kenneth Johnson, and it looks like the end of the question got cut off. So, Kenneth, if it's okay, I would like to unmute you so you can ask your question. So you should be unmuted now. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. My question was essentially the the modal shift in the transit center. Uh, modeling exercise is pretty significant and in, in my observation doesn't really align with what we've witnessed in terms of the last the modal shift relative to opening of the last few fast tracks commuter rail lines. Well this is Jacob let me start with a response to that and let me, I'll maybe ask others to kind of pitch in. Uh, so Ken appreciate your questions. Um, I'd say a couple of things here. One is that you know, keep in mind, we're looking to 2050, so we're looking at 30 years of growth. And in this particular combination, this is a pretty assertive or even aggressive sort of combination of, you know, both sort of a purposeful land use scenario um, along, with the, um, along with the transit scenario. So, you know, comparing that to what we've seen over the past few years, um, I think it's just a little bit of a different comparison. I'd say more that if we, you know, the things that have been done over the past few years in terms of the rapid transit expansion, through fast tracks, 
um, development around transit stations, you know, some of the things that might comprise some of the elements of these scenarios. You know, this is a little bit asking that question, what if we carried those things and amplified those things forward for 30 years? You know, what might it look like? Um, so that's sort of my initial response. I don't know if others want to weigh in. I mean, there's other things influencing those as well, such as the free transit. Um, that makes it a lot more appealing of an option and just a lot more houses and a lot more jobs near that make might make the trips make more sense for these people at 30 years from now. Ken, did that answer your question? I think it's a good start. I, I um, you know, I, I'm, I'm not seeing the, the details of the model and probably don't care to. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> that, that's helpful. Thanks. Thank you. Are there any more hands raised or any in the chat box? No, uh, there are no hands. All right. With that, thank you. Go ahead and move on, Jacob. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chair. We are in the home stretch. Uh, last few slides, I'm going to turn this section over to Robert. Yeah, so, um, you know, as, as Art mentioned, the tel teleworking could clearly be part of any one of these scenarios. Um, the other kind of big thing on the horizon here is the types of vehicles that we'll be driving in the future. Um, the first time we're showing this is how some, some of these more aggressive scenarios are the ones that achieve the other MetroVision targets do at getting to our MetroVision target of reducing daily transportation greenhouse gas per capita by 60%. As you can see, our 2040 MetroVision target is 10, and even that aggressive centers and transit scenario does not quite get us there on its own if we're using the current estimates from the MOVES emission model. That model is currently using the assumptions that CAFE standards as they stand today will basically stop becoming more aggressive in 2025. That's when the current regulation ends. So that's where you would get to the centers in transit scenario having 12.3 pounds of GHG per capita per day. However, um, as I mentioned, it's just the cafe standards. It doesn't incorporate the potential for small or large um, adoption of electric vehicles. So as you can see in these scenarios, if 25% of all vehicles became electric vehicles in orange there, Lots of those get us a little closer to our target, and if 75% or more of the vehicles driving around in 2050 are electric vehicles, obviously a massive reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. And next slide. And now this this is challenging topic of automated and connected vehicles. You know, there is so much research out there. We we reviewed a lot of it. We had discussions with Emily, who's running the AMP group, um, and Tweak lots of things in the model, um, but there are these kind of potential positive and potentially negative effects. You know, there's there's a chance that vehicles are just a lot more efficient. Capacity of, on our existing network is increased significantly. You know, there's less demand for parking because vehicles can park themselves or take themselves home or take themselves far away. There's a potential for lots of shared rides rather than um, being outweighed by the potential zero occupancy vehicles and deadheading. Um, and then there's lots of uh, room for safety improvements as these vehicles are never, you know, looking at their phones or anything. They're paying attention to the road. Kind of the inverse of those could be true too, where vehicles, um, there's there's regulation that requires more spacing between vehicles that are driving themselves and capacity could potentially decrease. Or people are driving more, there's more demand for parking. Um, or people don't care about driving as long because they can multitask and start their workday while driving in the car. So on the next slide, we, you know, we did put in a lot of, um, we did put in a lot of assumptions into a both kind of a positive effects um, scenario and a negative effects scenario. And what we don't feel, uh, you know, it's not like a peer reviewed <laughs> um, analysis of the potential for these vehicles. There is a huge range of possibilities in the future, whether that's, you know, a significant increase in, in some of these metrics we care about, like VMT per capita or congestion, things like those. Um, so, you know, we, we have some results there. They're included in the table in the tech. We didn't want to draw any specific conclusions because there is such a wide range of possibilities that could occur moving into the future. I don't know if, Steve, you want to add anything to what I said? Let me unmute. Can you hear me? Yep. Uh, no, I think you actually covered it uh, very well there, Robert. I mean, just stressing the 
the variance in this. There are just so many things. We, ben and I have been on, as probably many of you, I've been on many webinars and chats and professional chat rooms and things. And you know, you can be talking about one particular subject, you know, road capacity as an example, and you'll have, you know, half the room thinks it's going to be higher, half of half the room thinks lower, you know, especially on freeways and ramps. Uh, the social aspects that Robert alluded to of, you know, maybe people living farther away from work for certain reasons. Um, but then you have the opposite. So there's just so many things uh, that we we just don't know really how to test. And that that is what we did test. And you, you see the wide variation in results. All right, so check up next slide. Oh, that's that's it for me. So we've also had the opportunity to engage our youth advisory panel and our civic advisory group. Uh, those meetings were held in late February and early March. Uh, we didn't have any findings or analysis to present to them, but we were able to introduce scenario planning, the concept to them, as well as how Dr. Cog is doing it, and then introduce them to the individual scenarios. So what are the two land use scenarios? What were the five transportation scenarios? The big component in each of these meetings was a March Madness activity where we asked the participants what they thought the most important measures to assess the different scenarios were. So uh, next slide. So our March Madness activity consisted of 16 metrics that were pulled from the Metro Vision Plan and the Metro Vision Regional Transportation Plan. So not just those three metrics that you saw uh, throughout the presentation, but other, other ones that uh, are in our plans. Uh, through the discussions that occurred between the small groups and the larger group at the end, we found that the final four priority measures for the youth advisory panel were fewer deaths on roads, more electric vehicles, fewer greenhouse gas emissions, and more people have good access to transit and jobs. When it finally came time to pick the one metric that they thought was the most important, they actually ended up combining two of their priorities. So it became more people have good access to electric transit and jobs. We did the same exercise with the civic advisory group. Their final four were more low-income people have good access to transit and jobs, more walking and rolling trips, fewer greenhouse gas emissions, and more people have good access to transit and jobs. Uh, similarly to the youth advisory panel, they also picked more people have good access to transit and jobs by the time they got to their final prioritized measure. Uh, I will say during this exercise, we had really great discussion in both the youth advisory panel and the civic advisory group on uh, what happens when you start prioritizing certain metrics over others, uh, as well as uh, starting to understand that some of these are really, really connected measures, and some could actually be proxies for other measures. So that was something that we saw come out of the discussions from both of these groups. Next slide. Okay, thank you, Alvin. So we have finally reached the very last slide in this presentation. Uh, appreciate everyone sticking with us through, uh, through a bunch of data and a bunch of results. Um, as I said at the beginning of this presentation, really what we just wanted to do today was literally just kind of absorb and hopefully understand the plethora of scenario results that, that we've shared with you. Um, again, as a reminder, not just in this presentation, but in the table um, attached, to, uh, attached to this item in the packet, there's a lot of additional data and information. Uh, as I said at the beginning, we anticipate having this presentation uh, with our board in their work session on April 1st. Um, I believe we're also going to have a similar conversation with the Regional Transportation Committee at their April meeting. Um, and then we want to come back to you um, at your April Transportation Advisory Committee meeting and start talking about the path forward for the 2015 MBRTP. You know, what are the implications of these results for how we start putting the plan together? So a couple of questions, um, not necessarily for discussion today, but we wanted to kind of prime you to start thinking about for our conversation next month is, how should scenario results shape project identification and evaluation uh, to prepare the fiscal constrained plan? And how should these scenario results shape the financial plan investment strategies? You know, I think it's clear today that we've seen um, that certain strategies, certain combinations of things, you know, really move the needle one direction or another. What does that tell us about where we want to start putting some of these financial investments and how we build uh, the 2050, 2050 fiscal constrained uh, regional transportation plan? So that's what we'll talk about next month. Um, Mr. Chair, with your permission, um, we did receive a lot of questions um, on this item. We have addressed many of them as we've gone through the presentation. Um, but with your permission, Mr. Chair, I'd like to go through the remainder of the questions that we received beforehand and then open it up to any additional questions or comments. Uh, you have my permission to do that. 
Thank you, sir. So I'm just going to go through. Um, I'm going to go through the questions that we have not already addressed. Um, Eileen Yazi from Denver asked if there will be a technical memo related to this presentation and the scenario assumptions. Um, yes, there will be. Um, as we put together the uh, the 2050 uh, plan, um, we will include um, sort of this work documenting this work, both the methodology uh, and the results. So that will be part of kind of our final work product. Um, Eileen also asked, it seems as we it seems as if we can move the needle when land use is intensified. How does this differ from the assumed land use and zoning plans for each of the cities and towns? Will jurisdictions get to review the land use model again to refine the assumptions? Uh, for that, I'll ask Andy to answer. Sure. For the infill uh, scenario, there were no changes, no increases made to what we considered urban or interior suburban areas. Uh, however, we did have a 10% decrease in capacity outside those areas. Uh, so that actually is pretty interesting just in terms of showing that there is a lot of existing capacity um, depending on uh, the choices that are available in other places throughout the region. Uh, in the centers, uh, we did um, a, a 75 percent increase uh, in those areas that were included in that list of centers. That was station areas, urban centers, employment centers. So that's a 75 percent increase over uh, what was included in um, the base uh, considerations for uh, what we could see from uh, derived from local zoning and plans. Um, and we did a 25% decrease outside those centers areas just um, to help focus uh, some of the choices that were available uh, to the agents in the model. Thanks, Andy. Can you, um, the second part of your question about what jurisdictions yes. get to review the land use model again to, re yes. to refine the assumptions, can you talk about that? Yes, we're currently um, working uh, for the purposes of scenarios, uh, we used a regional control total. We're currently working on um, a forecast that uses uh, county controls, so that is more closely tied uh, to the state demography office forecast. Um, for individual counties, but still using our predictive model. Um, we're currently pivoting towards um, that product, and we hope to have a comment map um, up for local jurisdiction review um, in May. Okay, great. Thank you, Andy. Um, let's see, Eileen from Denver also asked, um, besides the focus model, has Dr. Cog evaluated other data analytics for prediction? Uh, the short answer, Eileen, is no, um, but actually if we could unmute Eileen, if she's still on the on the webinar, um, I'd actually like to hear if there's anything in particular in mind that you were thinking of. Uh, I no longer see Eileen on the call, unfortunately. Okay. Well, just to, just to say a couple more words in answer to Eileen, our focus model is our primary future sort of predictive tool um, on the transportation side along with um, uh, urban sim on the land use model that our land use team is, is doing on that piece of the work. So those are our primary sort of future focused uh, predictive tools that we're using in this work. Um, let's see. <clears throat> um, and I think I think actually the remaining questions we've addressed during during the presentation. So um, I think we're good, Mr. Chair, in terms of questions we received before the meeting. So happy to open it up to any more questions. Okay, thank you. Uh, Emily, were there any more questions on the chat room? Yes, yeah, there's a couple comments. So uh, the first one from David Kressinger, he says, transit development around station takes 20 plus years to occur from today's opening of fast track corridors. And he also said tremendous amount of work done by Dr. Cog's staff and the input group. Thank you so much. Okay. And then we have um, some, a couple more comments. Uh, Phil Greenwald says, I still don't understand why some managed lane corridors are included like US 36 and North I-25, but State Highway 119 and State Highway 7 are not included in the map of the modeling. Uh, he also suggests maybe we could talk offline about this uh, so he can better report to Boulder County or open that up and have a, a more specific call for anyone that wants a more detailed answer. 
Okay. Yeah, Phil, if you're still on the call, um, we'd be happy to talk with you on off, offline. And why don't we do that so we can get into depth just a little bit more? I um, appreciate your question and want to try and give you a, a good answer. Okay. And any others, Emily? Yes, we have one more from um, from Art, and he says, in the centers and transit, centers plus transit results, remind me, are the results based on the assumption that ridership are transit trips assumed free, or does the model not consider costs in generating the results presented? And Art is also still here if, we, if we'd like to unmute him. Yes, transit is still free in that scenario. Okay. If you want to unmute Mark, Art, we can see if that answered all his question. Art, you should be unmuted. Um, well, that answered part of my question, but I had another question, and that is, Fax Trust is completely built out. That would mean all the way to Longmont and everything, right? Yes. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Art. Uh, and Emily, was there any other questions? Um, no more questions from the pod. Okay. Uh, Melinda, any hands raised? There are no hands raised. All right. Jacob, back to you. Okay. No, I just want to say thanks to, um, I first want to thank actually our team at Dr. Todd. Um, as you can tell from this presentation, there were a lot of people who uh, worked together seamlessly to, to get us to this point of presenting all this information. So I do want to thank all the staff at Dr. Cog who worked on this, um, not just those that you heard from today, but um, but others on our teams who, who did a lot of work on this. And then I also want to thank all of you, particularly for a remote meeting, having this long of a presentation, but I appreciate everyone uh, sticking through and the good questions and conversation that we've had on it. So thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Jacob. Are we uh, ready to move on then to the next item on information briefings? And that's an update and information on the upcoming draft of taking action on region, regional vision zero. And Beth, I'll turn it over to you here. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Get my screen going here. All right, can everyone see this? Yes. Great. Thank you very much. I'm Beth Alba. I'm a transportation planner at Dr. Cog, and I'm going to be doing the overview of the draft of taking action on Regional Vision Zero. Um, what is Vision Zero? Vision Zero is a transportation safety philosophy based on the principle that loss of life is not an acceptable price to pay for mobility. It reframes traffic deaths as preventable. It integrates human error. It focuses on preventing fatal and severe injury crashes. It aims to establish safe system. It applies data-driven decision-making and establishes road safety as a social equity issue. There are three main principles that we're gonna focus on in this plan. Um, complete streets, which is designing streets that accommodate people using all methods of transportation, prioritizing safety for all users context appropriate speeds. Um, as you can see from this graphic, um, a person walking has a 13% chance of being killed when a vehicle is tra traveling at 20 miles per hour. That, present, that percent goes up to 73% when that speed is increased to 40 miles per hour. Um, and then equity, and that is just recognizing that disadvantaged communities are usually who are, are um, affected most by traffic safety issues. Um, so why the Denver region region needs Vision Zero. Um, in 2017, 266 people were killed in the Denver region streets and highways. That's a 50% increase region-wide since 2013. Um, and if you look at all the, at the percent of all crashes by travel mode versus the percent of fatal crashes by travel mode, you will see that the large percent of fatal, fatal crashes involve people walking, people biking, or people on motorcycles. Um, so we really need to focus on these vulnerable users as we move forward with initiatives. Engaging the community, um, if you all remember, we did extensive public, public outreach for this plan. Um, 
we kicked the plan off with the regional vision zero video that um, we showed in a prior meeting a short survey and an interactive map that allowed the public to select locations with safety issues throughout the re region um, we used paid promotions through social media to promote the survey and interactive map which resulted in 3300 survey responses and over a thousand interactive map comments um, and this map here just shows how the interactive map locations overlap with the data-driven regional hydrogen network and as you can see from the map the data the data-driven areas are pretty consistent with um, the locations the public identified so the regional vision zero toolkit is the bulk of the plan it consists of the data-driven regional high entry network um, the crash profiles that were broken up by area type behavior profiles and countermeasures and i'm just going to kind of talk about each one of those briefly um, the regional high entry network was developed by identifying road segments with the highest KSI crash density, KSI meaning killed and severe injury crashes. Uh, we used only KSI crashes from 2013 to 2017. Um, to make those identified segments a network, we linked um, based on proximity to those high KSI crash density segments and road continuity. Um, since the network was so large, we decided to do a more detailed analysis just along the identified regional high injury network. Um, each of the 10 counties within the Dr. Cog boundary were analyzed separately to ensure the critical corridors were dispersed regionally. Um, for each county, the critical corridors identify the top 50% of KSI crash density corridors by county along the re regional high injury network. Um, and there shouldn't really be any surprises along the identified regional high injury network. We gave stakeholders two opportunities to make edits to this. Um, by having large maps for each county at the stakeholder committee meetings and the local agency meetings we held throughout the region, um, where we gave stakeholders the opportunity to mark up and make comments on the draft hydrogen network. Um, we incorporate all those comments, so we're really hoping um, that this reflects areas you want to be identified within your local communities. And some quick statistics on some of the findings along the regional hydrogen network 75% of KSI crashes from 2013 to 2017 are included in the regional hydrogen network. 32% of KSI crashes are included along the critical corridors. This includes only 9% of the roads in the region, and that 9% does include local roads. Um, if you exclude local roads, the regional hydrogen network includes 27%, 28% of the major um, roads in the region. So if you think about that, the 9% of roads is a very small amount of area to focus on to reduce these types of crashes. So once we identified where these crashes are happening, we wanted to dissect those crashes more and figure out what's actually happening in those crashes, um, figure out some of the mechanics and behaviors involved, then start moving towards certain countermeasures that we might want to apl apply to reduce those crashes. Um, on a regional scale, we know the region is very diverse from a land use perspective. Crashes in rural areas are very different than what we're seeing happen um, in crashes in downtown Denver. Um, so one of the first things we did was develop four different area types, urban, suburban compact communities, rural, and limited access highways. Um, we identified those using a variety of different data, data resources to reflect um, the different built environments in the region. Um, if you look at the charts here, you can see how the KSI crashes and fatal crashes are different in each area type. One of the things you might notice is that fatal crashes skew a little more to um, rural and limited access highway, probably having to do with the increased speed of, increase in, in speed in those areas. Um, but once we started to look at some of the reasons why these crashes are happening within these areas, that's when we started to see more prominent differences. Um, so within the crash profiles and the behavior profiles, we wanted to identify three things within the area types. Um, first being the crash profiles, which look into the specific events and types of crashes that are occurring. Um, these um, highly inform the infrastructure countermeasures that we identified. Um, second, the behavior profiles, which are the, the human behaviors that led to the crashes happening. Um, one interesting thing we discovered is that the crash profiles are different in each area type in terms of what's causing crashes, but the behavior profiles are for the most part consistent in all the area types. Um, and lastly, we wanted to identify countermeasures, um, and those are strategies that are recognized as best practices for addressing and reducing the identified crashes. 
So this is a quick example of an urban air of the urban area crash profile. Um, again, this portion of the plan is meant to be a toolkit and not necessarily meant to be read cover to cover. Um, its purpose is to be a resource for member governments to read and understand and kind of figure some things out. Like I'm in a certain area type in my community. What are the mechanics of the crashes here? What should I be looking for? Um, how does that match up with certain countermeasures? Um, in this example of the urban area crash profile, you can see the percent of KSI and fatal crashes these four profiles account for in the area type. So that's 68% of KSI crashes and then 66% of fatal crashes in the urban area types. Um, then we do a more detailed analysis for each one of the four profiles. So using the pedestrian involved crashes as an example, you can see some of the CAG, um, subcategories. Again, the percent of KSI and fatal crashes this specific crash profile accounts for, um, information on where they are occurring, what time of day. We also included some of the survey results um, when appropriate, which reinforced that these are the crashes used um, people are seeing throughout the region. Um, at a regional scale, these are a bit broader than what you're gonna see at a city scale. Our hopes is that this is the first step in directing local governments on what to look for in the crash data. And we're hoping that this will begin to assist member governments on what they, on doing their own data analysis and provide them with the tools to start to dive into some of these issues um, at a more local level. Um, so taking action, this portion of the plan um, identifies objectives and action initiatives that we need to start working towards as a region. Um, the six main objectives are improved collaboration between allied agencies, increase awareness and adoption of Vision Zero, design and retrofit roadways to prioritize safety, improve data collection and reporting, um, increase funding and resources, and increase legislative support. So I'm gonna use objective four, improve data collection and reporting as an example. Um, this objective has four main action initiatives and then those action initiatives have sub actions to better identify tasks within the action initiative. Um, it identifies who will be responsible and who will take lead on the action and identifies what years the action will begin. Um, this is pretty much so how all objectives are set up. There are 25 different action initiatives in this plan. So um, I encourage you to do a detailed review, uh, review of these and submit comments, on, um, submit comments so we can incorporate them on the final plan. There are also performance measures that are identified for each action initiative that um, we will be tracking, tracking annually to determine um, which act, action initiatives we're um, making progress on. Um, the plan identifies multiple ways local jurisdictions can get involved in the upcoming years. Um, one of those is participating in the Regional Vision Zero Working Group, which we will be launching as soon as the plan is adopted. Um, participate in training opportunities, collect and analyze local data, apply for grants, such as the Urban Arterial Multimodal Safety Improvement Set Aside that Ron um, presented on earlier. That's a large amount of money that relates to this initiative and is a really good start on prioritizing safety throughout the region um, and join the regional Vision Zero network. Next steps to adoption. Um, we are attempting to keep the May 20th adoption date on schedule. Um, despite the fact that we had to cancel RTC and the board last week, um, we did send the draft out um, to both of those committees and ask them to do a thorough review. 30-day um, public comment period started last week, um, March 19th, that was last Thursday. Um, today is the TAC informational item. Um, public comment period closes April 18th, so please submit your comments um, before that date. Um, April 27th, I'll be coming back to TAC for the final um, plan action item. May 19th, we'll be taking the plan to RTC as an action item. And then if all goes well and as planned, um, the board adoption is planned for May 20th. And with that, I will take um, any more questions. I think we had one question submitted um, before, and that was by Ken, and it was, will the schedule be one month, uh, delay one month because the board did not meet to announce the public comment period? And um, I think I just went over that. We are trying to keep this plan adoption on schedule. So we're hoping that the fact that we sent it out to um, the board and RTC last week, that will kind of make up for what would normally take place with the board. Thank you, Beth. Um, Emily, are there any in the chat box? 
I don't have any questions in the chat box. Melinda, are there any hands raised? Uh, we do have one hand raised for Alex Heidright. And Alex, I will go ahead and unmute you now. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yep. OK, thank you. Um, I just wanted to commend Dr. Cog on the thoroughness and the level of analysis in the plan. Um, I thought it was very well done, and in particular, the section that outlines the counter measures for each crash type. I think that's going to be a very helpful resource for local agencies tackling this issue. Um, I did have a couple questions. Um, one, I wasn't sure if maybe I missed it in the plan, but is there a target year for the Dr. Cog region to achieve the Vision Zero goal? Um, so right now we have a, in our Metro Vision plan, we have a target to be under 100 fatalities by 2040. Um, we are gonna be updating that with um, the MVRTP update, and we have talked about discussing making a 2050 target to zero. Um, it's really not that much different than the 2040 target to 100. Um, it just kind of makes that go out um, another 10 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. I, I was going to say, I think it would be very good to have an actual target date for when the goal is to get to zero and not just the 100 as an intermediate step. Um, but I do agree it would be helpful to have the intermediate benchmark years to track our progress as we get towards zero. Um, yeah, and that's definitely something we plan on addressing in the future. Okay. And then my second question is, um, what teeth will Dr. Cog be using to achieve the Vision Zero target? And I guess sort of this is targeted towards the TIP funding and wondering if to to ensure that transportation project funding aligns with the safety goals, is there going to be an increased focus on safety in the TIP, including requiring projects to document and justify how they'll improve safety and up to potentially including requiring jurisdictions that get TIP funding to have Vision Zero target targets and policies in place? Um, we do have an action item in, in the plan um, to suggest that TIP funding be directed more towards safety. Um, and um, the obviously the urban arterial um, set aside that we're doing right now is kind of a good way to kick that off. Um, and then we're again, we're going to be um, tracking performance measures for each action initiative um, to kind of show who's participating, who's not participating, what progress we've made um, on an annual basis. Okay. And Alex, this is, this is Ron Papsdorf. I did want to weigh in a little bit on the on the TIP criteria. We'll we'll evaluate um, that in the context of the Vision Zero plan as we approach the next full SIP cycle and have a have a robust conversation with our members about how we reflect that appropriately in the next TIP cycle. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Alex. Uh, are there any more hands up or chat room items? No, there are not. Hey, All Mr. Right. Chair, this, yes. this is Jacob. Just real quick, if everyone can still see uh, Beth's screen with the adoption schedule, I did just want to point out that um, as part of releasing this plan for public comment last week, we're doing this jointly with our draft multimodal freight plan uh, that TAC has received recent briefings on. Um, they're on the exact same schedule right now for review and adoption. So. Uh, when you go and look at the materials of the public comment period for the Regional Vision Zero Plan, you'll also see the freight plan with it, um, and we encourage uh, review and comment on both plans. Thank you, Jacob. So um, with that, um, Beth, did you have any additional items? Nope, not unless anyone has any more questions. All right. All right thank you. Let's move on to our next item, uh, which is uh, administrative items um, and I'm going to turn it over to Carson to uh, update us on the uh, AMP working group. So Carson, go ahead. Thank you Mr. Chair. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, I will keep this short. Um, I think Steve Cook hit on most of what we talked about at the last meeting with the RTO and T set aside criteria that the working group weighed in on but we were able to elect um, some officers for that group. Brian Welsh is going to be chair from RTD and Ashley Nyleen from CDOT will be vice chair. Um, just so you guys can reach out in the future if you have any questions to either one of those individuals. Uh, at the meeting in 
March, back on the third, there was a discussion on prioritizing each of these tactical actions that came out of Mobility Choice Blueprint in a more thoughtful way so that the partner agencies could really focus in on the few important ones rather than kind of looking at the whole gamut. Uh, the working group gave some input on that and the message was relayed to the executive committee uh, of the AMP. Um, I'm, my understanding is that we will hear back as the working group on that prioritization conversation at our next meeting in April here in a couple of weeks. Uh, this is going to be really key if we try to really make an impact uh, each one of those tactical actions. Uh, CDOT reminded everybody that there's going to be a mobility technology data scrum they're hosting on May 6th and 7th um, out in Golden. I guess that may change, but uh, if you if you have any questions about RFCPing for that, you can reach out to me, I guess, or Emily, and we can point you in the right direction um, for that one. But be on the lookout for that um, as we get closer to May. Uh, and that with that, I will turn it back over to the chair unless we have any questions. Thank you. Um, were there any hands raised or chat comments? Not that I see. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Chair, this is this is Ron. Yes. Thank you. I just um, wanted to tell everyone thank you very much for your patience in working through this. I know um, we had a long conversation on the RTP scenarios that was time well spent, and I appreciate everyone sticking with us. The, this kind of meeting takes a little bit longer, just the logistics of it. So I appreciate everyone hanging in there. I don't know if all the attendees could see the number of people participating. But um, during most of the meeting, we had uh, well over 70 people um, participate in the meeting and appreciate everyone's interest. Hopefully not all of those were just uh, looky loos watching to see if this process would blow up on us. Um, and Mr. Chair, just uh, from my perspective, I want to thank you for working with us through this process and um, really running a very effective meeting um, under um, difficult circumstances and appreciate you engaging with us to help us uh, figure out how we were going to how we were going to convene this meeting and keep things on track. Thank you, Ron. I'd also like to thank the Dr. Cog staff for um, putting this together and making sure that it runs smoothly. I think it went a little smoother than when we did our run through last Friday and I thank you for the changes. And uh, with that, our next meeting is April 27th and we are adjourned. Thank you.